Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Independent uh, Science Board meeting. And uh, our meeting is going to run a day and a half. This afternoon we have a distinguished panel who will be uh, introduced in a few minutes, or I guess a few minutes after the seminar. And then uh, tomorrow we'll have much of our reporting on our status of where our reviews are, as well as another uh, panel tomorrow afternoon. So I want to welcome everyone. And we'll start off by just having a uh, around the room introduction of the board members and their declarations. Um, start with Liz. Liz Kenuel, no new declarations. Uh, Jay Lund, uh, here, uh, no new declaration. Uh, Steve Brandt, nothing new. Richard Norgard, no, no new conflicts. <laughs> Tracy Collier, no changes. Vince Resch, no changes. And Joy, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Joy right Devlin, no change. And we have two of our members who couldn't uh, be here today, Joe Fernando and John Weens, who are both uh, on travel. So for the rest of the afternoon, we're going to turn it over to uh, Vince Rush. Well, welcome to today's Brown Bag Seminar. Uh, as you know, these seminars are hosted by the Delta Stewardship Council, along with their partners, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Watershed Restoration Grants Branch, and the Service Water Ambient Monitoring Program. Uh, the typical announcements, please remember to silence your phone. Uh, the uh, bathrooms require a key, and the keys are on the door. And please uh, remember to put the keys back when, uh, when you return. Uh, the Brown Bag Seminar Series that's concentrating on monitoring programs in the Delta uh, has been put together in an attempt to get a wide variety of, uh, of approaches and opinions about the monitoring that's being done in the Delta, largely to inform two reviews that the Delta Independent Science Board is doing. The first of these is on a review of the monitoring enterprise where, uh, process that's underway in the, in the Delta, which is, as you know, very extensive and very complex. Uh, and also a review of the IEP program. And so today's seminar really bridges both of these, where we'll be dealing with the, the uh, origins and the activities of the IEP, along with the fact that they are one of the major uh, groups that are in charge of monitoring uh, in the Delta. Uh, I'd like to introduce Steve. Uh, he is a title geomorphologist. And he is the IEP lead scientist. So we can't think of anybody more appropriate uh, to have leading this discussion today. Uh, prior to this, he worked uh, for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for the CalFed program, uh, and the Department of Water Resources. He brings uh, much experience from these different positions. Uh, he also has uh, did his graduate work at Davis with a master's in international agriculture and in PhD in ecology. Uh, one of the things that, of course, is most interesting in his background is the time that he spent in the Peace Corps in a variety of roles in uh, two very difficult postings, one in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the other in Gabon. So uh, we will have, uh, he has agreed to do comment, uh, listen to comments and answer questions afterwards, and we'll have a microphone that's set up there for uh, people to come up. Uh, also, copies of his PowerPoints are available. What we'll do is we'll follow this with a break of about 10 minutes, after which we'll start uh, by uh, introducing the panel that we have and some of the questions they're going to be dealing with. So Steve, thank you. I can try to adjust the microphone a little bit. Will that suffice? Uh, thanks very much, Vince, and uh, to the ISB for the invitation. Uh, I speak to you uh, today on behalf of quite a number of people, I would say, into the hundreds. Uh, so uh, thank you to all of you for your contributions uh, within and among the IEP agencies. Uh, of course, anything that I get wrong today is uh, solely my fault, so you can blame me for that. Uh, a couple of things uh, as I begin. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to emphasize what I think of as uh, this talk being something of a narrative. So if, if you have questions, could, could you write them down and we'll get to them at the end. 
One of the things that I'm um, constantly struggling with, with with the IEP and with the interdigitation of these agencies in general, is there's always a, a, a tendency to stop people in mid-sentence and, and, and quibble with something they've had to say. And I think that interrupts our ability to, to, to describe what we do as a narrative that's actually to be enjoyed and celebrated. And you can ask questions about it at the end. But honestly, um, uh, I, I think that way, that sort of reductionist approach to taking issue with, you know, every little clause that someone has to say or every little piece of the science that we can take issue with is kind of getting in the way of our communications. And I think you'll find today that one of the emphases that we have uh, emerging this year uh, and specifically for my agenda as we move forward uh, in the new year is uh, an emphasis on science communications. So so please, we, we welcome your questions. We want to get to them uh, in, in depth, but I think it might be best if we just uh, sort of wade through the whole thing here. And I'm planning on about an hour, so I better get going. Um, so please write your questions down and hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to get to them at the end. So uh, the, the sort of title and theme of my uh, talk today is IEP Management Science, Theory, Practice, and Future. And as you might uh, guess, I've, I've broken the talk up into three main parts. Uh, the first is going to be some background on some of the organization. And yes, you will see an organizational chart. And no, there will be no quiz about that chart. But I, I have to go through some things that describe the, the program in general that um, you know, sort of uh, in many ways are ideal in nature. And um, you know, sort of your eyes may gloss over, at least briefly, uh, until we start talking about the real substance of the program. Um, and, and what I wanted to introduce there is there is a theory behind this. There are some structures that we thought about and some ways of articulating these agencies that we think are advantageous. But I will suggest right now that it is rarely the case that we sort of do that all according to plan. So then we'll move into a, a segment uh, that has three uh, examples, and that's the practice segment. Uh, I'm going to describe, and I, hopefully as I go, I'm going to move from the monitoring part to the decision-making part by sort of starting with a monitoring program that I'll deta detail in a, a little bit, and then move to uh, sort of a, a, an information accumulation and sharing piece uh, a little bit. And then the third example will be uh, uh, actually sort of how we put together our annual plan. And I hope that that makes sense to you. So we're going to move from monitoring to sort of informed decision-making to actual program implementation. So, so that's what I have there on the practice part. And then the future bit, uh, hopefully I'll have time at the end. Uh, I've got myself allotted seven minutes or something for talking about the future. And that's where I think we could lay out a lot of the questions that we think the ISB can help us with and, and what I think is on our horizon uh, 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 and, uh, within the IEP. So there's your orientation. Um, one of the uh, things I like about um, uh, astrophysics and uh, celestial investigations is that they have really big equipment. And um, so this is a, 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 do any of you know what an LST is? Also, the cosmologists, they're really plain about their language. And LST, which you see depicted here on the slide, is a large size telescope. <laughs> um, and that's great because, you know, they investigate things like the Big Bang. Right? So um, I, I think if, if we can, you know, one of the things I like about this is that it uses simple language, but the real point here was I want to emphasize that my perspective, as I mentioned, you know, there are as many as 200 people involved or more in this enterprise. My perspective is just one perspective. And I represent something of an independent voice for the nine agencies that are involved in IEP. But just about everybody involved is likely to have a, a little bit different view on, on what is happening and, and how things should go. And I wanted to emphasize that I don't think you could ask any 10 people to describe the IEP and actually get the same sort of answer and, and uh, description. And, and, and to, to, to my view, that's OK. Uh, there's nothing wrong with people having a slightly different view of it. I hope that what you'll get out of this is uh, a description of places that we could help improve our communication and interaction. But I don't think that there's necessarily something necessarily wrong with, uh, you know, putting together a telescope that gives you a very accurate image, but that uh, puts it together using, you know, as many as a couple of hundred different pieces. So that's a struggle, right? I mean, trying to get that to go anywhere, uh, you know, herding of the cats, if you will, is, is hard. But I don't think it's necessarily wrong. So I wanted to start with that. My perspective is that. My perspective, and since it's my talk, that's what you're going to hear today. Hopefully informed by these other 200 people of which I speak. 
Uh, the other thing I wanted to make sure that I got to was uh, uh, for the, the prospectus that I was handed for the, the review today, I wanted to make sure that I identified at least three things that I'm going to be addressing specifically in case I'm, I'm, I'm too vague about that. The first one is uh, in the review of this, how the science is using, how we're using the science now and how would it be used in the future. I mentioned it briefly. Uh, the IEP or the ISB asked about this, the use of uh, and creation of science narratives. And, and for me, that's, uh, uh, you're going to hear a little bit about that from the Bay Area of the base study example that I'm going to use, uh, but it, for me, I've, I've uh, talked to the coordinating, uh, coordination team uh, recently, uh, and, and one of the things that I'm um, going to try and, and try my hand at this year is creating some of the science narratives that come out of the, of the IEP work and some of the science that we do. So I specifically think that the IEP can be doing a better job, and I'm going to take a shot at, at, at an example or two of those in the coming year. The second thing was uh, the ability of the IEP to use ecosystem forecasting mechanisms uh, in its work, and I think we've got some very good examples that you're likely to be hearing about uh, as a community later this year, and they're coming out of the Delta Smelt scoping team. There's a, a very interesting combination of uh, uh, what I guess one could call hierarchical modeling, where we end up informing uh, some pro, uh, uh, particle tracking uh, model software to, to get a, a handle on what we think uh, contributes to entrainment of Delta Smelt in particular at the federal and state water project facilities. And in my mind, if we do that well, and it looks like it's uh, coming, coming along nicely, uh, we, we could be entering into a world of, of ecosystem forecasting uh, soon. Uh, and so I, I wanted to mention that in case it's not clear that, that we're doing some of that. Another thing that the ISB has asked for is, is how are we supporting the management of water export facilities. The smelt working group example that I'm going to give you, which is example number two, I think, uh, when we get to the uh, practical part of the, of the talk, should hit on some of that. And then the last one is um, the effectiveness of the current institutional arrangements that support the interagency investment. And here I wanted to make a comment about, um, and, and, and this is, this is actually kind of surprising to me. Um, we've had a, a, some introspective um, uh, uh, coordination team uh, meetings where we've been describing to each other how we think the financing works behind the scenes of, of our IEP activities. And one of the things that we all took away from that exercise is just how remarkably fragile this arrangement is. And um, one of the things I think is common is that there's a certain um, tendency for people outside the IEP in particular, but even inside the IEP, to ascribe to it as, as a concrete and mortar character that, that, that is not true, that doesn't exist. Um, we play the role of a convenient punching bag for a lot of people, and the nine member agencies in turn also sometimes choose to blame certain things on the IEP depending on the subject of dissension or the current topic. But somehow, even though we don't have a real place and we're just an agreed upon group of interacting agents, we do provide improvements to agency science and scientists. And I firmly believe that the collective enterprise of an interagency ecological program are worth the investments and the frustrations. I hope to shine a light on what needs improvement, like uh, while I understand that I, uh, let's see, back up. I hope to shine a light on what needs improvement, but I hope you'll also understand that I've made a personal and professional commitment to this program by filling a leadership role in the IEP, and I'm trying to help guide the ship. I'm not trying to sink it, I'm not trying to run it to ground, and I'm not trying to keep it sailing along aimlessly forever. The science sausage making factory that I know best of the IEP, I enthusiastically participate in, and I know everybody in that enterprise welcomes this review because it means better science, more meaningful, useful, estuarine understanding. I'll leave that there because I think I'm already behind schedule. Not bad for part one. So, how are we organized anyway? Well, you get the org chart here. And um, I've toyed with cutting this apart into different versions uh, and going through trying to explain what's here. I, I don't think ultimately that's a useful strategy. Um, other than to suggest that there are four tiers of involvement with the interagency ecological program. We have the agency directors at the top who provide, um, I'll characterize as approval for what we send their way. Um, the coordination team, to me, is where the real interagency interactions occur. This is where the, project, uh, the program managers interact and decide really what their programmatic uh, imperatives are to be. 
Underneath that, you have program support team and science management team. That's really, in my mind, where the science sausage gets made. And uh, to be quite blunt and, and short about it, we're doing pretty well there. And I hope to be able to describe some of that to you as well. One of the other things that I think we're trying to improve our contact with is the bottom set of boxes, which are advisory groups and technical teams and uh, project work teams. Uh, I won't go into a whole lot of detail there, except to say that there are sort of uh, the, the core group are the three upper boxes, the directors, the coordinators, then the science management team and science program support team. We have, you know, probably on the order of dozens of affiliated scientists who chair these project work teams. And while they may not attend every meeting that I go to, uh, they have their own meetings where they decide on their priorities. And then the idea is that that gets uh, funneled up to uh, the science management team and the coordinators. I think that's working well in some cases, and we need to make improvements in others. And, and so we can talk about that. Um, I'm going to get way behind now, I can tell. Uh, a little bit of uh, additional background before we move into my practice slides. And that is, I think it is useful to go back and look at the MOUs that have brought us all together. There are different ways I can describe what we are now, but I think it's interesting to pay a little bit of attention to what happened in to get us to where we are. And I'm going to go backwards through the memorandums. I've got a couple of the six or seven that are official. But it's useful to hear verbatim some of the language that's in those memoranda. This is from the 2016 uh, MOU. It's an amendment. So at some point, they decided to stop rewriting the MOU and just amend it. So this is actually an amendment. But th um, this is about partnerships. And, and um, two things are important in this document. This agreement in no way restricts the parties from participating in similar activities or arrangements with other public or private agencies, organizations, or individuals. You might have heard otherwise. Another interesting clause. The parties intend to work collaboratively and anticipate a need to share party resources to effectively implement IEP work plan elements. This may include the sharing of staff, equipment, space, and other resources where there is substantial involvement and mutual accrual of benefits by participants. Sounds pretty good. We will develop and regularly update procedures and policies collectively and individually as appropriate to preserve and facilitate timely exchange of information. This is uh, from a previous document, uh, 2000, the previous version, 2000, the year 2000. So the, pre the one I was just speaking from was 2016. This is two th the year 2000. Um, some of this is getting into too much d detail. I was going to talk a little bit about take. We can do that later. Um, so I'll skip that one. I'm now back to 1990. So 1990, the MOU. In 1990, and this is important, this document, the MOU, this document will serve as the basis of authorization for future exchanges of funds, personnel, and equipment between the member agencies in the development and conduct of studies and required monitoring of the effects of federal and state projects on the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary. Actual exchanges will be made annually on a case-by-case -case basis as agreed to by the agency coordinators and agency directors and will be dependent upon available funding. So what I was getting at there is there's an agreement that this is a collaborative effort and that, that people are buying into the fact that we're going to need to rely on each other to do that, even though there is no real building or IEP in and of itself, right? But the agencies have agreed that the only way we're going to do this is collectively. And then lastly, um, I think, it, well, this will just sort of reinforce the point. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. I'm, I'm now looking at the 1971 memorandum, and it's reiteration of the same thing, and it's support for ecological studies in the San Joaquin, uh, Sacramento San Joaquin estuary. So that's a little bit of background on the program. And then one more thing I wanted to say here, and then I, I, I wanted to ask, honestly, given some of the discussions that we've been having lately, and, and you know, maybe this is me wandering too far away from the science and into the political, but we have to do it because that's the landscape within which we operate. I, I, I made a note to myself a, a question. Uh, have we arrived at a socio-technical point in time to really re rethink how we administer jointly valued data collection, interpolation, synthesis, and reporting vis-a-vis -vis water project operations and the San Francisco estuary and its ecological character? 
So we've, we've, we've stated that this is a collective goal that we need to pursue, and somehow the review is asking, um, you know, how, how are we going to do this better? Is this necessary? Are there different ways of considering how we do this? I don't think there's any question that this is at least part of how we should do this. But I'm hearing and I'm seeing behaviors that would indicate that maybe people are considering alternative arrangements. And that's fine, but we should, we should do that uh, knowingly and we should commit that by uh, commission rather than omission, if you will. Um, so now I'm going to cast the nets to the winds, if you will, and talk to you about three examples that I think begin to walk the, my, uh, my understanding and the, and the subject matter at hand from these basic understandings and organizations through sort of practical implementation. And then, as I mentioned, by the end, I hope we're getting to things like programmatic uh, decision making and, and annual plan uh, maintenance and uh, uh, construction. So uh, the first one is uh, uh, some, a, a program that's been uh, uh, sort of familiar to me for, for many years. Oh, now I'm, I forgot. There was a whole thing here. Let me check my time. One second. I may have decided to skip over way too much. Yeah, so um, 20 minutes. I'm going to... I was just about to skip over um, some details of the institutional arrangement that I think will be helpful, but I will no, by no means put to rest. And you're free to ask lots of questions about this later. Um, and that is uh, sort of, you know, since we don't have a brick and mortar building that is IEP and nobody actually has a central IEP budget, like how do you guys put together your funding arrangements and how do you make those decisions? Um, well, through the structures that you've, that you've seen there, and I, you can ask questions about procedure, but what ends up happening at the end of each year is that uh, Greg and the program staff uh, sort of put together a list of, of funding priorities that have been made in the agencies and between the agencies, and our annual budget is a description of sort of what we do every year. And many people say, well, you know, how did you get there? Like, what did IEP do to get there? Like, what room did you sit in at the IEP building, which there isn't one, to make those decisions which were made sometimes in consultation and sometimes not. And so, but we do track the budget. We, we can describe to people how much it is we spend, but it's not because uh, a central agency actually made single entity decisions about how that money gets spent. So I hope that's consistent with what I just described. Um, the details uh, are... are detailed and we'll skip them for now but uh, I wanted to give people at least a sense of the sort of the dollar amounts that we're talking about the major players in who spends money for IEP uh, uh, purposes and what it looks like you know in sort of standard uh, financial form uh, ways and 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 there's a reason they don't let me anywhere near the finances I'm a scientist right I, I this stuff is great I'm glad Greg knows how to do it but um, my description is gonna not do service to what's involved it's it's incredibly involved and a lot of the times by the program support team and Greg is spent trying to get their handle on what other agencies are doing in support of IEP uh, activities. And so here you have it. You know, most of the money comes from DWR and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. There's a substantial uh, mo uh, minor input from CDFW. There are some other people who contribute, but we're talking, if I added that up right, we're talking on the, on the uh, somewhere in the order of 33, 35 million dollars a year that gets spent on monitoring activities vis-a-vis -vis the, the impact of the state and federal water projects. Um, there, you can go through uh, different ways of slicing what this is and how it gets spent. I think you can quickly see that 71 plus 28 is 99 percent of it is compliance or compliance related spending. Um, we can describe how those things get characterized or categorized. I would like to acknowledge that uh, recently and increasingly there are uh, some inputs from sort of non-traditional IEP entities in this regard, including uh, some of the water contractors, uh, again, some state funds, and then uh, most recently uh, the science program and even the, the, the academic community. Um, these discussions about funding and monitoring occur in other places. That's one of the other things that I feel like I have become 
uh, comfortable with. I know in early days in the estuary when I was with DWR, and depending on how, who you talked to and how it was discussed, you sort of thought, well, maybe IEP is the be-all and end-all of monitoring in the estuary. Well, at least over my education and the t last 20 years, that, that's not the case. There's plenty of things that are going on beyond the IEP, and I think we're finally comfortable enough in our own skin that we can say, and that's okay. There's, there's places for people in this enterprise that don't necessarily involve, you know, that brick and mortar place of the IEP that I talk about all the time, you know, that doesn't exist. Um, even so, the, you don't have to be part of the MOU to be part of the community that does this. Uh, there are ways to, to look at the investments across uh, different sort of uh, um, uh, uh, subject matters, if you will, or organizational, you know, whether it's status and trends or modeling or pure research, which we don't do very much of these days because we don't have money. Um, here, uh, in case you're wondering, is um, a depiction uh, of the last three years, I think, and where the bulk of our directed studies money, so any additional monies beyond the routine ongoing monitoring programs, uh, this is a slide depicting uh, where those have gone, and, and in case, you know, if you're interested, we can go into the details of that as well. Um, again, another different slice at it. You can look at it by various species. Um, and all of this is something that Greg spends a considerable amount of time and his counterparts at DWR, the Bureau, and uh, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service spend a lot of time sort of tracking that. It's a, it's a significant input of time. So, so that's that. So now I'm back where I thought I was and trying to m now take a walk from what I think I just finished, which was a sort of conceptual, basic, uh, underlying arrangement of, of entities uh, through uh, what do we actually do in the field and how does that ultimately work its way up to management uh, inputs. And I'm going to do that uh, three ways. And they're going to get increasingly management oriented. This one's going to start out um, fairly monitoring oriented, but it should work its way towards management. If I'm, if I'm at all good and if I remember what I put on the slide. <clears throat> and special thanks to um, Marty Gingras and his staff at the U.S. Uh, at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for the background on this. I learned a lot uh, soliciting materials from those 200 people I mentioned before. Uh, whether or not I actually am going to retain it all is a different matter, but I'll try to give it to you today as best I can. So this is the Bay Study. You may have heard about it. Um, it was established in uh, 1980. It, uh, it takes uh, monthly samples uh, f along the axis of the estuary in a variety of locations. It's one of the only studies that we have that sort of gets its way all the way from the interior delta all the way down to the South Bay, which is uh, interesting. Um, uh, it's uh, founded, one of the founding documents that Kathy Heeb shared with me was the, it's the uh, study of delta freshwater flow, the needs of the San Francisco Bay ecosystem. And the figure one in that document is what I'm showing here, and interestingly, even you know, in such ancient time as 1980, there were people who were taking a, a, a whack at sort of what they thought the implications were for a water project and, and water uh, uh, extraction from the estuary. And you know, if you just think about the volume of water under those curves and how the volume left in the estuary over time has diminished, um, you know, I'm not saying that there's a causal relationship between these things, but boy, you know, my simplistic ecological mind says, hmm, there's been some change here and and um, you know I, I get that people are holding our feet to the fire when we try to describe what those changes actually are and to ascribe responsibility for them and causation to them I get that that's science but I, I don't think that this figure should go unheeded as something that people were thinking about even at the inception of the the Bay program the Bay study uh, so what the Bay study does when it goes around all those uh, um, uh, dots on the map that you saw earlier is 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 deploy two sets of gear. Um, the first is an otter trawl, and uh, some of you may be familiar with the fact that the otter trawl drags on the bottom or as close to the bottom as you can get it without getting it snagged all the time. So you're sampling sort of the bottom of the water column. Uh, uh, granted, the, the net has to be lowered and brought back up, so you're going to get some of those fish. And then at the same time, they do a midwater trawl, and uh, I know this is adapted from uh, Jeremiah Bautista's uh, uh, wonderful slide showing uh, how this gear is deployed and retrieved. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that you're also sampling uh, in, the, in the middle of the water 
water column. And then some, some stats that Jeremiah shared with me that are, are just sort of give you a characterization of, of what such a monitoring program does in a year. Uh, this was for 2015, 71 species. So that's one of the other points that I hope we can remember to think about here is that even though we may be here because people are driving home the needs for delta smelt and longfin smelt and the listed species, um, many of these programs and my own ecological thinking is really thinking about everything else that's in the estuary as well. So when we're talking about like what are the needs of the IEP monitoring program, those discussions tend to be dominated by the listed species, and I get that. But as an ecologist and as a monitoring program that was devised to uh, examine the impact of water project operations on the entire estuary, I think we have to acknowledge that there are 71 other species out there that, are, that we're collecting information on and that people are beginning to make understandings about. Uh, 117,000 fish, lots of anchovies. Uh, uh, so this is not only fish, it's crabs and shrimp, and of course the water quality sort of comes along uh, by default. I don't want to give that short shrift, but I have learned over my time as a f ecologist that the fisheries work seems to be a lot harder than some of the water quality work, and I know I'll get booze immediately as though I say that. But but anyway, uh, I, I, I kind of pine for an automated sensor that I can drop in the water and get information back on it. And again, booze are welcome. You can say, no, that's not why. But anyway, uh, the, the fish part's really hard, and, and of course, but the equally valuable is the water quality work. I mean, we know so much about what's going on of, for water quality reasons because these people started to monitor water quality at all those stations monthly, you know, 40 years ago, 37 years ago. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the uses of the Bay study, which I'm not sure they had on their minds when they uh, conceptualized it, uh, but it has been useful for this purpose, is the identification of invasive species. We've got the Shimofuri and Shokahazi gobies. We've got mitten crabs that were first discovered by the Bay study, uh, Exopaleomon modestus, um, and I suspect that uh, there may be more on the horizon. I guess some of these, sh these are going to be now beyond my uh, personal experience, but some of the shrimp species that we're encountering now are, are sort of, you could point to the Bay study as the place where we discovered that those were, were, were arriving if you will. Um, I wanted to mention that it is one of uh, the only programs that, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, extends beyond sort of mid-bay, if you will, mid-estuary, mid if you will. It goes beyond uh, San Pablo Bay into the, into the south and, uh, central and south bays. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through that. And then one of the last things that the, the staff at, at, at the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, have impressed me with, and I've visited the lab several times now, is, um, you know, all of those thousands of fish, nearly 100,000 fish, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, from 2015, they have to be identified, counted, and sorted, and sampled, and stored. And there are people whose lives are spent doing that. And sometimes we don't necessarily acknowledge the expertise that we're sitting on. This is a world-class fish and invertebrate identification lab in uh, Stockton. And when people say things like, well, you know, the IEP needs to add these other things, and here's all the stuff you need to be doing. Like, are we thinking really about training the people who need to staff these labs? Because it takes years for these people to get good at what they do. And when people say, well, I, I can collect these samples, and that lab can turn it around in 48 hours, well, those are really, 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 really trained people who are told to turn those around in 48 hours. If you have to bring new people on, it can take years to get them up to speed, and the turnaround times are going to get much longer than that. So your ask of such a lab, and such a program need to be scaled to that. And that's one of the things that I think an improved communication and uh, articulation at the level of the MOUs that we discussed earlier and that I think the ISB might be considering giving us some advice on should, should take that into account. Um, so there's one last thing I wanted to do with the base study stuff in case you weren't impressed is run through a list of titles of things that um, they've published over the years. And I'm not going to go through all of them. It's like an impossibly long list. Um, but I think uh, if I did my job right, you're going to be impressed. I, w I am. Split tail contributions. Mang and Moyle, 1995. Status of split tail in Sacramento, Sacramento and San Joaquin estuary. Summer Baxter and Herbold. Resilience of split tail in the Sacramento San Joaquin estuary. Smelts, Moyle, Herbold, Stevens, Miller, life history and status of delta smelt in the Sacramento-San Joaquin estuary. Rosenfield, Baxter, 
2007, Population Dynamics and Distribution Patterns of Long Fin Smelt in the San Francisco Estuary. Mertz, Hamilton, Bergman, Cavallo, Spatial Perspective for Delta Smelt, a Summary of Contemporary Survey Data. Mers, Bergman, Meg Melgo, Hamilton, Longfin Smelt, Spatial Dynamics and Ontogeny in San Francisco Estuary. Nobriga, Rosenfeld, Population Dynamics of Longfin Smelt in the San Francisco Estuary, Disaggregating Forces Driving Long-Term Decline of an Estuarine Forest Fish. Beaver, McWilliams, Herbal, Brown, Fiber, linking hydrodynamic complexity to delta smelt distribution in the San Francisco estuary. For striped bass, Kimmerer, Cowan, Miller, Rose, analysis of an estuarine striped bass population, influence of density-dependent mortality between metamorphosis and recruitment. Summer, Mejia, Hebe, uh, Baxter, Lobachevsky, and Logi, long-term shifts in the lateral distribution of age zero striped bass in the San Francisco estuary. Jasby, Kimmerer, Monosmith, Armour, Klern, Powell, Schubel, and Vendlinski, isohaline position as habitat indicator for estuarine populations. You know that X2 thing? Kimmerer, to effects of freshwater flow on the abundance of estuarine organisms, physical effects, or trophic linkages. Kimmerer, Gross, McWilliams, is the response of estuarine nectin to freshwater flow in the San Francisco estuary explained by variation in habitat volume. Uh, I could, I am going to go on. Uh, Baxter, Brewer, Brown, Tchaikovsky, Fyrer, Gingras, Herbold, Mueller, Solger, Nobriga, Summer, Souza, Pelagic Organism Decline Progress Report. Kimmerer, 2006, response of anchovies dampens the effects of an invasive bivalve. Fyrer, Clern, Brown, Fish, Hebe, and Baxter, estuarine fish communities respond to climate variability over both river and ocean basins. Right? Pretty impressive group here. Um, it's almost impossible to list all the EIRs, the plans, reviews, and other gray literature that's used in the base study data, that has used base study data. The long-term management uh, study uh, or strategy for dredge disposal and dredge windows, Bay Bridge construction and demolition, San Francisco airport expansion, tidal marsh restoration, the salt by salt ponds in particular, sa sand mining, Costco, Busan spill, shell oil spill. The data has contributed to surf perch, recreational, and bay shrimp commercial fishing regulation, and Pacific herring commercial fisheries model for the San Francisco Bay Delta, or San Francisco Bay. So amazing, amazing survey, right? And it was because people got together and said, what are the projects doing to the estuary? Um, one of the most important papers, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it off here because I really don't have time to it, is the Jim Clern paper. He did this with, with Kathy Hebe and a list of others. But the data set is clearly shown here. And you can see that we developed a notion of how decadal oscillations in the coastal ocean and the estuary have affected the resources of the estuary over time. And it's because we collect data like the Bay Study data that we get to put pictures like this together. And I don't think that can be under uh, sorry, overemphasized. It's a really big deal. I wish I had more time to go into it. I'm going to move to my next example. This is more clearly water project focused. It will feature the fall midwater trawl and the environmental or the enhanced delta smelt monitoring. And I think I'm doing okay on time here. So the genesis of the fall midwater trawl was um, to measure the abundance and distribution of age zero striped bass, and that was in 1967. Most recently, uh, it's been mandated by the Delta Smelt Biological Opinion for the combined operations of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Projects. So there was a genesis for this study. People were doing it because they thought it was important to look at the impact of the projects on striped bass. And then it's gone along over time, and then at least as recently as 2008, and I'm sure before that, but at least as, as written in the Federal Register in 2008, it's a requirement now because people said, hey, we can tell something about the Delta Smelt in that survey. At least that's what I thought would have happened. Oh, incidentally, one, one observation I wanted to make as I go on. That base study that I talked to you about uh, in terms of annual budget from the IEP contributing agencies, about 4 or 5 percent of the annual budget. Um, so the fall midwater trawl, uh, it's, has, it's gone through some expansions. There are definitely problems with it. We know that it doesn't sample the shallows well. And so you've heard lots of people say, well, it's a completely ridiculous sampling mechanism for delta smelt because it doesn't sample the shallows. 
Yeah, we, we know that. It's a big net. It's hard to deploy in the shallows. We get that. But I don't think that that means that it's not a good sampling device, particularly if you're looking at it over time. Again, I'd be willing to listen to other people's input on that. I think one of the challenges for the fall midwater trawl and the, uh, is the fact that it was tied to an index that needed to be made every year. And that index that needs to be made every year impacts people's ability to use water in the system. So rather than assail the index, or the fact that we need more information about fish in the shallows, we tend to just say, well, the fall midwater trawl is not what we need it to be, or isn't what we tell people it is, or something like that. So it really is to measure the abundance and distribution of selected fish species, pelagic fish species in the estuary. It's to gain an understanding of the factors affecting abundance and distribution of those fish species, to provide a baseline uh, data set to evaluate management plans and habitat restoration projects, and to measure the availability of fall plankton food resources at least since 2010. So how does that work to this notion of um, informing the management directive. Well, as I said, there is a, an index that is made that's used to track uh, the abundance of the species and to uh, help calculate how much incidental take the projects can have before restrictions kick in. And, and so that data, the, the fall midwater draw, trawl data that I described, uh, shows up like this. And these are, this is directly from uh, D Department of Fish and Wildlife memos, the, the most recent one dated uh, December 21st of last year. It tells you about the, the abundance according to that survey. Uh, these are, um, let's see, uh, there are monthly surveys September through December. Uh, they do oblique midwater trawls at each of 100 stations and they make this calculation of the index. And so here are examples with the inset figure being the most recent five years. Again, you know, the recent insets could show you some pretty dramatic ups and downs, but I think it's useful that if you look at that across the entirety of that data set, um, we're really talking about some pretty small movement of those bars compared to what was here when we started. Uh, um, monitoring, and, and again, I'm not ascribing, you know, causality here. I'm just saying that the management um, uh, monitoring objectives that people put out there for themselves in the 1960s and 70s allow us to know where we are in 2017. And so calls for, like, it's not relevant anymore, which I hear, are, are puzzling to me. So I wanted the, I wanted the review board to understand that these are some of the discussions that we have. And in some cases, uh, American Shad last year, you know, did, did really well, you know, and I, I don't, I don't want to stand up here and describe why that may or may not be the case, but we have a survey that tells us that for whatever reason, that species responded well in what was a recordly wet year, if that's good English. So, um, I think there was a realization that, um, uh, the fall midwater trawl was doing certain things, but that there were additional information needs as well. And we knew this because we had done some work uh, in the wintertime in particular, winter and spring, with a, a different type of gear. And this is the uh, spring Kodiak trawl. And, and this is a quite a different setup. You'll notice that it's a net towed between two boats, and it's a, it's a big net. And I, I gather a little bit unwieldy, but people figured out how to use it. Again, you're not sort of sampling the shallows with something like this. And we know that, and there are uh, efforts afoot in our current annual plan to, to sample the shallows more effectively. But again, I don't think it, it puts into question uh, these indexes that we've derived over time, uh, it should uh, provide us additional information. I'm not sure it's going to tell us that we were wrong all those years, but, but, you know, as a scientist, you know, somebody occasionally can tell us we're wrong. That's okay. So anyway, picture of the, of the gear there. This particular uh, uh, sampling uh, uh, genesis was from uh, the early warning system that you may have heard about. That people were particularly interested in, in finding out, is there a way to detect smelt Delta smelt on the way to the pumps early enough that we could ramp down pumping and not entrain them, but not so early that we forego, you know, otherwise uh, pumping water that didn't have any fish in it, for example. Again, thinking that the only fish in the water would be delta smelt, of course. Um, uh, there was a, uh, an also a, an expressed need by the Fish and Wildlife Service, some, some very talented modelers who said, you know, if we could get some of this data a little more frequently, it would really inform our life cycle modeling needs. And then, uh, again, most recently, and this was uh, from uh, just over a year ago, 
the WIN Act, uh, it's actually required that we do more. Uh, I'm not sure that this particular study was outlined uh, except to say that uh, we need increased monitoring and distribution studies. So that was used as uh, a way to describe the purpose and need for the uh, 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 enhanced delta smelt monitoring of which this, this net and, and this gear is now uh, a, a part. Uh, so, you know, these are ascribed to various uh, sample areas and uh, it's informing a number of things uh, including some risk management models and some predictions about when you need to ramp down pumping and I think it really has improved the statistical validity of the samples themselves. Um, again, we're, I wanted to show you that, uh, you know, you've really, oh, and I forgot the last one. So remember that, uh, uh, um, I keep forgetting the numbers. The, uh, the last study I described, uh, so the fall midwater trawl, we're talking 1.5 to 2 percent of the annual budget. So now with the EDSM, you're going out and you're sampling much more frequently, uh, uh, in fact, at times um, daily, as I recall. Um, over a longer period of time in the year, and I wanted to show you again the picture of the uh, the slide of the uh, of the lab crews. You, you're really generating a lot of samples now, and somebody has to you know ID and archive and store and all of that. So kudos there. It's a real challenge for us. Um, I will say that it also has required an increase in uh, resources, and I think my notes uh, suggest that the early, the enhanced delta smelt monitoring work is now uh, tw 10 to 12 percent of our annual budget, just for comparison purposes to those other studies. So what happens to that data, which is kind of now my transition to sort of walking this over to the Uh, to the analytical needs and the information needs of the decision makers. Um, in my experience, well, it gets used in a lot of different places, but the one I wanted to point out for you today was um, the smelt working group. Uh, so that data, the, the EDSM data is available uh, weekly. Uh, very good summaries. Uh, you can click on, on any number of these links. They, they work very hard to get that data out quickly and it's, it's QA, QC, but again, it, it places tremendous burden on the infrastructure that we have at IEP and I, I would like to have us discuss ideas you might have for, you know, how we might better manage that and, and provide for that. Um, so, you know, as this information gets collected, like where does it go and what do people do with it? Well, the first thing I'll point out is that you guys have probably already been involved in reviews of these long-term operations. The Lobo Review discusses some of this uh, on a biannual basis now, I believe. But there's also annual uh, transaction reports that come out describing how the smelt working group provides its recommendations to the water operations people and how they make recommendations to the Fish and Wildlife Service for administration of the BOs. Uh, so that's available here and and in links. Uh, the specific components that the smelt working group speaks to are usually, uh, well, in this case, in this example, are um, migrating pre-spawning adults uh, and their larvae and, and maybe early juveniles. So we're talking about the, the winter time and, and early spring here. And that really seems to be uh, where um, we can have um, effective actions taking, taken that would uh, diminish the entrainment of Delta Smelt into the, the water projects in and of themselves. Now what I will say as a working scientist in an estuary is that you know, that's not the only life stage that we uh, think about and that's not the only way Delta to smelt and other fish can die. So we always need to keep that in mind. This is just a piece of the overall puzzle. And um, to my mind, as an ecologist and as an estuarine geomorphologist, as Vince mentioned, um, it certainly would be better in my mind if we were able to think about these things as an estuary a little bit more than we are. But nonetheless, we have to fulfill these, these uh, regulatory mandates. And so that's what tends to get talked about. 
particularly if we're willing to be reductionist about it. So anyway, here's a slide that shows you that the smelter collected information about the smelter collected all year round. Uh, I mentioned before the fall midwater trawl, which is in the upper right hand, that sort of focuses on the September to December period. Um, but the enhanced delta smelt monitoring that I just described is, is an attempt to make that year round and to really intensify and to stratify and randomize how we collect that information to make it more statistically robust. And I think it does. But again, I have to call attention to the fact that it, it requires considerable additional resources. And then just as a comparison, if you wanted to say, well, was that a good choice for how we deploy resources in the IEP? Um, this is the fall midwater trawl index in the black overlaid with what we can deduce thus far with the Kodiak gear. This isn't necessarily the enhanced delta smelt monitoring program, but it shows you what the um, uh, different gear is and, and what it is sampling. And I think it, you'd be hard pressed to say that there was a whole lot of additional information provided, at least from this comparison. And all I wanted to point out there was that we are learning things through EDSM, of course, but, you know, we have to sort of begin to think about what are we spending our resources on and how much additional expenditure are we willing to give for similar information? We could use help with that. And I think a, 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 some attention to the arrangement of how these discussions occur could, could benefit us. So again, um, this is a, a, these are data traces for the kinds of information that are fed to the smelt working group. And I haven't done a very good job of describing where we are now with that. So um, this group meets weekly during the smelt entrainment season, which is roughly the winter time once it starts raining. Uh, and they try to take this field information that IEP is mandated to collect and make some, uh, make some policy relevant uh, decisions about when to restrict pumping or when it's okay to continue pumping, uh, identify what the risks are to the fish, do they have the kind of conditions that they need to survive in other parts of the estuary, when do we pump, when should we not pump, where are the fish moving, why are they moving. And so the information that I'm describing that comes from the Bay study originally, but now so from the EDSM and from the fall midwater trawl, that's this information and this gets fed to a group of people who advise the Fish and Wildlife Service on sort of what its policy decisions are, what its operational recommendations to the operators are. So um, again, relying on colleagues from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, some of you may have seen this at last year's IEP workshop. Uh, Mike Eakin and Chad Dibble in particular have helped me put together this uh, so that I can be cogent uh, w w using their descriptions uh, where mine maybe aren't. Uh, so a little bit of a review, but in case I've, I've, I've not made it clear, um, our role is to use these long-term monitoring programs as part of the weekly synthesis of data that gets to the smelt working group. And they include these studies that you see here. Um, the surveys take uh, generally a week or more each to conduct. Uh, however, once the data, once the fish get collected and uh, identified, that data it can be disseminated fairly quickly to the people who need it. Uh, let's see, uh, depending on the number of fish that are encountered, you can either tell people about it immediately or wait and give a summary at the end of the week. So that's going, there's some uh, uh, assessment of, of what's going on there before these are moved uh, into the decision making process. And then at the very least, these things uh, occur on about a weekly basis. So you go out and you do the surveys and within a week you can tell people what you've encountered in the field and then it's up to them to decide what that information means. And this speaks to this, you know, the, the WinAx, you know, you know, desire to, 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 to add uh, more intense and including distribution information, well, this is the kind of information that the fall midwater trawl has been generating for a, a long time. So again, how, how did we achieve the balance that we have? Again, just a description for that. Um, so, you know, we acknowledge that the monthly sampling that the fall midwater trawl has been doing might not be the best to um, uh, provide information for the, for the need to provide weekly inputs to the operators. So, so that's been an improvement. Um, again, what does the raw catch data mean? You know, there needs to be some assessment of when you encounter one fish, does that mean one fish? When you encounter 400 fish, does that mean you've just caught every fish in the estuary? So it's not just as simple as conveying the numbers ahead. And then we'll talk about um, some of the other issues uh, that, that are well on my mind when you begin to, to look more closely at how this information is collected and disseminated. And coming down the home stretch here. So that leads me to these things, a couple things that I've been pointing out along the way. Where does our mandate go? 
should we concern ourselves solely with listed species? Should we think more and more about feeding guilds? Are we really interested in the monitoring program that informs us about the Bay Delta ecosystem? Are we talking about management and analysis and assessment of the entire San Francisco estuary? And in my mind, this is, you know, from an estuarine ecology point of view, have we lost the estuarine thread? Are we focusing so much on the smelts and water project operations that we're missing a lot of the other things that are actually, you know, leading to the demise of many of these fishes? So um, that leads us to what does IEP put together annually as a group of agencies in its annual work plan? And my apologies to Alan Bullock here for those of you who know his study in tyranny. Uh, we may just be talking about a study in tyranny, but in any event, we do it every year. We put together an annual work plan that is basically a reflection of what the agencies have decided, our priorities for spending for any particular given year. We do it a year in advance. We have uh, specifications for timelines and, and, and requirements for, you know, information needs and evaluation um, that I suppose we could go into um, if you want. I think you've already reviewed many of those documents before. It, it follows uh, a sort of generally agreed upon principles and it builds on some of our program and program documentation including our strategic plan the science strategy which we're now launching on an update of this coming year so prescient and well timed because impact or input that you might have on your review of the institutional arrangements can be reflected in our review in our update of the science strategy which is going on now and then what's depicted here is that we build the work plan through a series of uh, meetings and discussions at the coordinators and, and uh, uh, science management team and then we basically make recommendations to the directors who approve it. Um, we think, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, so I basically just outlined that. Uh, I did want to emphasize that there are uh, published calendars for how this occurs, and yet um, even though we've got MOUs that identify the nine agencies and the roles and responsibilities of those nine agencies, and even though we publish and have now uh, gone through uh, a, a set calendar for how we do this twice, there always seems to be uh, several items that don't conform to anybody's calendar and that really challenge the working relationships between uh, all of the IEP working agencies. And that's largely because uh, either one or several agencies, uh, you know, have a new imperative forced upon them that they have to come to the management and monitoring enterprise and say, you know, we've got a new priority this year and we think you guys sh should be responsible for doing it. And we're happy that people are coming to us with that. We do think we have the expertise to conduct most of those studies and to make sense of the information that we collect. But it often comes without due consideration of the resources that are needed to add that to the list. And I'll get to a slide at the end here where you'll, I hope you'll be impressed with the things that keep getting added to the list, but the roster of people who are responsible for this doesn't really get all that much longer. So you've got more and more things for the same amount of people to do with less and less resources. And as I mentioned, you're generating more and more samples and like who's, who's mining the mint, right? For those of you who know the late 60s movie. Um, so this was just a, an illustration of the calendar that we use. Um, this is an illustration of the number of people involved uh, to, who put together, uh, you know, the annual plan, and it's a considerable pool of talent and expertise. And I'm very proud to be part of that group. I just um, would love in, in my life if we could do it without such a severe limitation of resources just once. It would be really great. But um, you've probably heard enough about that. So uh, this past year, here's a list of the directed studies. You can ask for details about what each of these mean and how they uh, improve our monitoring enterprise and how they will improve the information stream that we give to the to the decision makers we, we think it's an improvement every year we think it's a, a, at least a, an incremental improvement um, and we wanted to point out that uh, a, a real highlight of the arrangement thus far and again this is uh, sort of me having been through this now the first time one full cycle uh, there's a really um, uh, comprehensive, uh, that's not the right word, a, a, a really um, effective uh, strategy of review that occurs before things get into the IEP work plan. And it really points out how in spite of all the various uh, challenges that I've been describing, 
we, we actually managed to get a lot of things done, and it's actually working pretty well. There's an administrative review to make sure that things are, you know, in and all of the elements are there. There's a science management team review that focuses on rigorous, efficient, effective science. There's a coordinator's review at the level of the program managers that decides is it relevant for their purposes and is it coordinated to the extent possible. And then finally, the directors give an approval on that. Um, Again, we can talk about that. And, and, and before everyone say, well, you know, Steve, you've been talking about many of the challenges. Um, you know, why don't you point out many of the successes? Well, I, I'm having a real struggle pointing out the successes. And it's one of the things I want to do this year uh, uh, very directedly. Uh, this is the first three pages of, I think, something on the order of an 11-page uh, bibliography. These are papers that were published either with or among or for or using IEP data in 2017, roughly. Uh, it's 50 published manuscripts. I think if you think about that in terms of, you know, how much did that cost, I don't know, $100,000 might buy you a manuscript uh, if you were to, uh, you know, go to a competitive uh, grant process. So that's $5 million of publications. I struggle to find a director who knows much about any of those papers. They don't hear it from us. They don't hear it from me. They don't ask. They hear it from other people. And I think that's one of the things that we'd like the independent review board's input on is how can we make a more cogent and effective science message? I think it starts with describing what's in these papers in languages and, and terms that, that directors will understand. And that's one of the things that I'm going to put for myself in the coming year. But I think we could use some help in, in, in thinking about that. Again, I think it's a really impressive set of things from a group of people who really don't have any place together and who don't have a brick and mortar, but who have a, an agreement that combined and collaborative estuarine science is the way to do business. Uh, I think that's to be celebrated. We don't do that enough. We look pretty good. So what's next? Um, and I'm down to my last two minutes, and I think I'm going to make it. Um, I think even our harshest critics have to agree that we're improving our monitoring, analysis, and synthesis. So how can we continue this progress? Do we quicken the pace? Do we avoid, can we avoid the occasional cross-communication and miscommunication? Um, as I mentioned, I think we're really working on the science communication pieces now. But the enterprise, the, the universe of mandates that we're going to have to satisfy information needs for is going to expand. And that's uh, this slide. There's, there's a lot of pieces that are going to continue and come online needing information from the estuary in, and from sampling programs of the kind that the IEP is good at. But does that mean the IEP should do all of them? Or does that mean that we'll have the resources to do all of them? Um, I don't know. Um, this is a slide I mentioned earlier, you know, starting with uh, some of our earliest studies in the, in the late 50s. Uh, you'll see the Bay study coming online in 1980. You know, we, we, we seem to be adding information to the stream all the time, and it's gotten to be quite a mountain of information, if you will. But our ability to store that information, to exchange it properly, to understand what's in it, may not be what it should be or could be if we had uh, institutional arrangements that facilitated that kind of thing. And again, I think that's a, a subject for your review. Um, other challenges that we're going to face, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure any of us, and I'm looking around the room at, at, at some of the friends I've seen here the longest, you know, we've been confronting this rare species thing for a long time. It, it's not going to get any easier. And yet the demands on getting the answers that we need, you know, they, they, they keep coming harder and faster every year. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe we're on the verge of a breakthrough with tagging that might occur with Delta smelt soon. Maybe, hopefully. That would be a real improvement, I think. Um, what about the big deal changes that are happening in the estuary that we're only just starting to talk about. What are the real changes to our infrastructure and data collection regimes going to be? And where are those discussions happening interagently? We're starting to have them at IEP, but are people going to stay at IEP and have those discussions if they involve lots more money and lots more expertise? So where are we? Uh, this is for Vince. He, he mentioned my Peace Corps work. Um, this is uh, 
the Benekalundwe in southeastern Congo, and every year they have a Chianza ceremony. And uh, I guess we call it Kwanzaa here. Um, it's not exactly the same thing, but I was lucky enough to be invited along one year. And you go there, and uh, the chief has a week to sit and listen to complaints from everybody involved and, uh, you know, tell them the stories of the things that have been happening to the, over the last year. And, and then um, he gets, uh, like, a final day where he feeds everybody and tells them what his plan of action is for the next year. And then they either, you know, run him out of town or, or, or re-anoint him. <laughs> and, and then they have a big meal and they break all the dishes and they go home and they do what they had said they were going to do for the year. So, I, you know, I kind of feel like at the end of my first year here uh, at, at the uh, leadership of the, IS, or the uh, IEP and the science program, I sort of feel like this is what I'm presenting to you here. Um, we've, we've got some programmatic problems and communication problems and the arrangements and the financing you know they're not they're not everything they could be or 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 maybe should be but they are what we have so do we you know try to make use of what we got or do we break all the pots and go our separate ways and i've heard i've heard opinions uh, you know both ways that no we we can make tweaks and we can make this work i've heard people say yeah you know it's not not working for us and and i think i think we're at an important point the last thing I'll say is, is this, and I, and I wrote it down, and I, and I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for it, but there's a reason I wrote it down, because I do feel strongly about it, and I'll end, I'll end with this. Success and promotion for individuals involved with the IEP comes from within their specific agencies. Promotion of individual agency agenda and positions vis-a-vis -vis San Francisco Estuary Science is um, incentivized above supporting the IEP collective. This has been the case for a while now, but the idea of shared resources and expertise was the foundation of the program and has on occasion been remarkably successful at doing just those things. And I could point out the pod, the flash, the 40 to 70 pre-reviewed publications per year, et cetera. Of particular note and concern now is the individual pursuit of specific agency, project, consultant, or management objective by whomever holds sway in whatever initiative or conversation happens to be catching key agency director's attention on any given day. Fortunately for me and for my personal objectives, we still need science and we still need data and we need help interpreting what the science can say to managers. And note, I didn't say what the science means. I mean, what's the science, what can the science say to managers? Pulling qualified scientists out of their managing agencies to perform quality informed data collection should be the goal and we need to find a mechanism to promote program managers who enable, encourage, and celebrate the collaborative community science. I welcome the ISB's review and recommendation in this regard. Our IEP science has never been more relevant, more necessary, and more fragile, and more subject to fragmentation by our body politic. So with that, um, let me close my remarks and thank you for your time and attention. As always, thanks so much, Steve. It was for us trying to wrap our heads around, especially us from outside the region. I've been aware of IEP for 25 years or more, um, and seeing how it's working and hearing sort of the from the inside what's going on with warts and with accolades all mixed in is really good. I I want to just say to your last point. Um, how do you incentivize people to contribute to a collective when all of their reward system comes through their agency in a very, it's almost obligatory, that it has to be stovepipe, you can't reward people for that collective effort. Um, that's one that people around the world grapple with. Um, we're not the only ones here. We dealt with it up in Puget Sound. Um, it really takes a camaraderie and the productivity that you showed here so that people can go back to their individual agencies and say, no, this really is good. But it's still, it's it's one that I think as a, for the ISB, we should pay some attention to that and see if we can 
help based on, especially on some of our experience in other systems, because that's a that's a real profound problem. Yeah, if I can just follow up on that, I, I agree with Tracy. There, one of the ways that is um, uh, that everyone who publishes papers and they uh, realize that the best way to get a large number of publications is through a lot of teamwork. You may be the 27th author, but if, if that still counts, that still counts. And sometimes if an agency can recognize that um, uh, publications are your ways for promotion, and it doesn't really matter whether you're the first, second, or third author, uh, that will uh, sort of, if you can get the agency to do that, then you can, then the individual scientists who uh, want to get promoted and want to get publications will by very nature uh, go out and work in a collaborative way. Uh, but I don't know how you mandate that to, to different agencies. Yeah, in my experience, we've been extremely lucky in have sort of discovering people at the at key uh, program management levels who've who've enjoyed doing that and who've understood the value of doing that. But there's no requirement that that occur, and that's kind of my fear. Um, you know, where we have that, uh, and and we do have that, and you've seen the evidence of that. It's 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 wonderful. You know, I I don't see the agencies adapting a mandate. Any of the agencies adapting a mandate, except maybe the USGS, uh, for you know participation in in research and publication and management relevant uh, technical memos necessarily. Uh, outside of what's useful within their own agencies. But as I said, we, we've been lucky. We've had program managers who recognize how valuable that is. And right now, you know, those people are, are supporting our efforts. But I'm not sure that that has to, I, I hope that that's not, I hope that that's considered to be a fragile arrangement and that we do things to continue to bolster those efforts because this is a fragile arrangement. <laughs> you know, it's an MOU. Uh, the agencies don't have to do this stuff. I have a, a quick question. So, uh, you know, I've I've also been aware of IEP for for decades, and um, you know, one of the things that I see that's extremely valuable to it, particularly under uh, rapidly changing environmental conditions, is the long term value of the data that you've collected. So, um, I, I know that there are challenges, and I know that. Uh, Maybe the, the program has to evolve as we go further, but I'm curious to know how much appreciation there is for the value of that long-term record. Yeah, well again, uh, this is my perspective, and it's, it's just my perspective. Um, among the science community, it couldn't be more valued. It couldn't be more uh, coveted, and it couldn't be more uh, an example of the way we should do things. It couldn't be more useful as an example of the way we do things. I mean, I consider Jim Clern and his colleagues to be, you know, my scientific uh, acolytes. You know, those are the people who I aspire to be, right? And and they're saying, and they have said for many years, this is what this data set is for. It's the basis of any sort of long-term evaluation of the direction and, and performance of the estuary, and you need that, and, and I, I bought into that. I mean, you know, you don't go to UC Davis and, not, and don't understand the value of even simple long-term data sets as the basis for your continuing and improving understanding. Um, so the scientific community values those almost above all else. Uh, I'll, I'll take criticism for that last comment, and that's fine. Um, but I'm not sure that um, agency directors feel the same way, because the criticism they're getting is, man, those guys go out and do 100 surveys a month for what? They're collecting nothing. They're getting zeros. Delta smelt aren't even in the nets. They avoid the nets, or things along those lines. And yet, they still collect delta smelt. There aren't very many delta smelt to collect that they collect 71 other species. And if we want to continue to tell people things about the estuary, some of those 71 other species are probably going to be the species we're going to use to do that. So I think it's a matter of communicating the value as opposed to challenging people about the value. 
Um, and, you know, they're always going to be detractors, um, but, you know, for 1.5% of the budget, um, are, are you serious? I just had a, a specific question. Um, one of your slides, you said that there was a mandate now to do a distribution study. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Uh, probably not. Um, I'm not a I'm not a, 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 a Win Act scholar, but that was an excerpt from the Win Act of 2016. It was I could I could go back and find the exact passage from which it's it's referenced. Or is that but, being done now? Or uh, yeah, well, so that is one of the one of the justifications and 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 um, rationale for and and funding for the uh, for the enhanced Delta Smelt monitoring program. Uh, specifically called out, and they said, you know, thou shalt do this. And and again, I, I, I think it's uh, it's been a, a real eye opener for me uh, and for the IEP in general. I think in in you know educating us for alternative ways that we can get things done and collect additional information. Uh, but it's been a challenge to adapt to the demands that that program has has put on us because it's a lot more sampling, uh, and 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 that's just it. It's just a lot more sampling. Is it a uh, broad scale sampling s geographic study? Is that the enhancement or is it uh, more detailed looking at diel and tidal cycles and inshore, offshore kind of thing? Or um, There are people here who could describe it in more detail. Uh, it's an explicit uh, acknowledgement that um, these things can be um, divided into strata in different ways. It's an explicit acknowledgement that um, uh, a randomized design should be the basis for where you pick where, where to sample. And it's an explicit acknowledgement that um, daily or at least bi-weekly, uh, but I think daily sampling is, is really what you need. And you can't really get at it with uh, twice a month or monthly sampling. And all of those things, are, I think, are, are very true. I mean, I don't know that anyone has any issue with that. Um, but that's 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 I believe what was behind the language. They 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 said you know I I don't know how bills are actually made, but you know I I suppose somebody said we need you know diel sampling by you know daily randomized, and they said we can't put that in there. And just put you know more and better, and that's kind of what you got. I mean th that's what I know of legislation. <laughs> Um, th thank you very much, Steve. That was really a nice overview of, of a pretty complex beast. Um, it, we really exist in an era of problems that are, are more than any one agency can handle. And, and no one agency really has credibility and capability to address these issues. And many of these issues really require the technical expertise of, of many agencies and others often even people outside the agencies occasionally, to, uh, to provide the insights and, and the broad communication that you need to make the insights um, useful. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if IEP did not exist, that this board would probably recommend that it be coming into existence, um, although I'm not sure it would be exactly the same way. Uh, so, I, but, so I think it's, it's really a great institution, and certainly as I've been around here over decades now, even though I'm a modeler and I, I work more on the water supply side than in stuff in, in the ecology area, I've, I've certainly gone to my share of IEP meetings and, and, and listened interested, with interest to the annual reading of the entrails of, of what was read inside of <laughs> fish's stomachs. You know, it's, <laughs> and I've been frustrated often by the lack of insights that have come out or, or, or the, Maybe the insights were there, but I'm just too dumb to understand them and to appreciate them. And again, that comes to back to communication with, with, uh, with dumb engineers and things like that. I had a few specific questions for you, though. Um, two, what, what do you think is missing from IEP now? And how do you think IEP activities fit with the notion of a Delta Science Plan? Uh, the first, second one's easier. Uh, I think. I think we are easily the estuaries data collectors, particularly for fish resources and, and their food. Um, and I think we know how to do that, and I think we do that pretty well. And I think, um, you know, in pursuit of requirements for the biological opinion, um, 
you know, I, I think that's a, a, a sweet spot for the IEP. So I, I, I see the IEP as playing a, a, you know, a similar role regardless of the institutional arrangements and, and mandates as, you know, the on the ground data collectors for, for the information needs that people have with, with supplementation. I mean, there's, there's some things that are easily seedable to other people who do it well or better. Mm -hmm. And I think had you, I've made comments uh, to that effect at the directors recently, and I hope to write those up, and so maybe at some point the community can see those. But you know, there are places where, and this is what I said before, you know, IEP doesn't have to do it all, but I think we're pretty well situated to be doing a lot of it, and 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 we've proven that we can do it. Mm -hmm. The the first part of that question is 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 much more difficult. Um, what's missing? I mean, um, you know, I don't want to be. I, I tend toward the flippant. I don't want to be flip. But I think one of the places where we've alighted recently, and we've made a couple of, I think, important improvements in understanding is the synthesis portion of what's going on. Even if we're not collecting the data and presuming that we can get the data collectors involved in our discussions, which I think is vital to the synthesis effort, I think we have a real strong role to play and that we're not quite hitting on all cylinders yet in synthesis of this information and what it means for policymakers, and that feeds right into the science uh, communication piece that I'm that I'm trying to maybe garner some support for and try and make some stabs at myself. The you know so there's there's some really talented you know interdisciplinary people that we have available to us now, and they're just sort of hitting their strides within the within the program, and they're making their first efforts at the drought synthesis and and and, and you know trying to come up with what was the impact to the estuary of you know some big deal changes to the water and not project oriented. I mean you know climate oriented, mm -hmm. and 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 it's really I think it's really going to going to blossom soon. Um, and I think, you know, I made a request again at the director's meeting last month for six positions that would support synthesis in that effort. Um, we've got two or three now, and they're making good progress. The flash reports that you may be familiar with, the, the mast reports uh, that, that you may be familiar with, the pod report that many people here at this table can remember, you know, those were good examples of where you, you got some people uh, to do the synthesis part and we really made uh, credible improvements in our community understanding of many things. Maybe not amongst the scientists because they sort of do that mm -hmm. as a matter of course, but it, I think it filtered up to the policymakers in a, in a way that we hadn't really experienced before. And I think we're, we're, we're doing that now. So if I were to say what's missing right now, I, I would say maybe that synthesis piece, although we're making strides. The other thing is, you know, something that you guys are going to take a look at, and it's kind of the reason why I had that sort of that that stair step slide, and the mountain of of information that we're continuing to add on to our list. I think at some point it would be useful to have somebody stop, maybe us, and say, "What is all this doing for us? Are there duplications?" And 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 not from a program standpoint, mm -hmm. from an information standpoint, you know. Uh, and we've had some of those conversations, but the institutional arrangement is difficult because even though you might see in the data that, well, this data set is duplicating this other data set, or there are gaps in this data set that this other data set could fill if it only went out on Wednesdays and didn't go out on Tuesdays. And we really haven't found a mechanism to have that discussion because you know you're talking about people's programs and that's the way we've done it and and I don't mean to put it in such ambivalent light there but one of the things that was really interesting recently um, and Ted and some others were involved we we had a discussion uh, about a, a proposal for some uh, smelt resiliency strategy actions that might be being taken in Sassoon Marsh and you know at the science management team level at the IEP the discussion very quickly got to, oh, you guys, here's the information I think I need for this project. What do you guys think? And immediately the response was, oh, man, we can help you with that because we're out there anyway. All we got to do is move down, you know, 100 yards and we'll nail your spot. And, it, and that was the kind of thing that um, I think you would discover if we were allowed to stop and say, look, forget your agency hat forget your program, forget to whom you're responsible as an agency, as a program manager in your agency, what are your data needs? And do they overlap or are there gaps? And we talk about that all the time. 
but we don't seem to be able to find the mechanism to so, get to that. So would that fit in as part of a planning, Delta Science plan process? And could, can you imagine that fitting in yeah, underneath that? Potentially, but that's pretty granular, right? Yeah, maybe it ought to be. Potentially. Steve, thank you very much. I think we'll uh, take a break for about 10 minutes and we'll come back about five minutes after three and uh, talk to our panel about uh, your talk. Thank you. Coming up now, that uh, I want to thank, start by thanking the panelists who have agreed to come. This is a, really an effort that we appreciate and certainly helps us as we start on our, our review. What we've asked is that uh, each of the panelists open up with about a five-minute introduction describing their involvement and interest in IEP and especially their, their views on governance issues, that uh, the structure of the governance surrounding IEP. Uh, many of you have seen this list of questions that we've provided uh, them as a way of possibly thinking about, uh, about how they would like to address their comments initially. But also at that point, after each one goes through, we will ask that uh, a kind of a dialogue of, you know, additional comments you want to make, comments about others' presentations, and then also open it to questions at the, at the microphone. So uh, this will be... Uh, Kind of the more information we can get, the better. And we'll start with uh, with Greg Erickson. Thank you. Put this on. There we go. Um, my name's Greg Erickson. I'm the acting regional manager for the Bay Delta region for our department. And my role in IEP is as the chair of the coordinators. And in that role, I try to facilitate communication, encourage organization kind of the things that you're focused on. But first, one should ask always is why? Why am I there? And why did our department put me there? Because essentially, my time is loaned from CDFW. And so they decided to do that because they wanted to encourage leadership. Leadership at the scientist level, the manager level, the director level, and between organizations. Because ultimately, there's no simple way, as we were talking about before, how do you address that fragility? Because ultimately, we like to go from the shalls, those requirements, to the shoulds, and actually try to encourage folks at all the levels to really envision the coulds. That's when we really start um, coming up with the advanced ideas and the solutions. When we get more combative and we fall back into the shalls, and what must we do? Um, the value for the management relevance goes way down. And having, being someone who's been on both sides of that, both using the data and um, trying to help uh, the production of that, I can, I can definitely see there's, some, there's sort of a magic here. And it is the fragility. Um, first though, I'd, I would like to thank Steve for his presentation. I thought it was a really good kind of overview. And I don't know if you've ever seen that commercial where they say, this is not your dad's Buick. This is not your dad's IEP. And the reason I say that is IEP is a very organic thing which has grown over time. If you were involved five years ago, it's different than today, than 10 years, than 15 years. It's adapting. And that reflects the people, you know. Um, people bring... Um, that, that relationship, and that's sort of that magic where they're going above and beyond and getting to the coulds when they're willing to take their hats off and they're really taking to heart some of the things that, that Steve was talking about. But it is fragile in that relationship um, 
people bring their time, their talent, their treasures, but anybody can, any time, can pick up and say, I'm going to take my marbles and go. And you're not going to get from the shalls to the shoulds to the coulds if folks are doing that. You don't do that alone. You know, the science, one of the things that's unique about it is it's integrated, short-term, long-term, different activities. Actually, as you're developing those, those studies, you're looking at how does it fit with everything. It's also ongoing. This is not one quick study that we hired out, we got the results, and we're done, answered one hypothesis. As we saw some of these long-term things, by doing that as an integrated way, we're answering questions that we haven't heard yet. That's crazy powerful. And it's also multi-party. You know, when you look at the credibility and legitimacy of, of your science, having those multiple parties coming together and being willing to step through the process or that MOU agreement, um, again, this is not something you can do alone. Um, I think it's, it's quite open and reflective. There are a few struggles, and I, I think that's part of what you guys want to want to look at and, and some ideas. I think one of them is balancing fidelity to our members and fidelity to the process and that transparent process that's necessary for good science in trying to be timely in this sort of adaptive management time frame and these, these efforts, right? We want to get things on the water, but we want them to be good things because if we don't, and we need it to be integrated. Many of folks comes in and they say, well, I want to do this. I don't want to follow all those processes or rules and have all these, I already had my stuff reviewed. Why do I have to have it reviewed? And you'll see people giggling, you know, because they've dealt with that. Well, it's because it's part of that overall process of trying to build something larger than the individual that, that is critical. I think also, how do we struggle with that massive communication process and synthesis of the needs? What are those needs and how do we bring those to build? We need to not only understand it, but also build consensus and do so in a way that leverages the different resources. Funds come from different purposes that have different criteria within the agencies. And it's when you have the consensus that people are willing to step up to the shoulds and the coulds and trying to find other ways the funds come in. Which highlights a, another thing that kind of came up is, how do we balance today's needs and being adaptive and responsive? Hey, we need to get out here. And, and periodically, I hear people say, should I redirect this long-term stuff? How valuable is that? You know, because they're looking at today's issues, and I fully understand as a manager, you get things and you have to answer a question in a hurry. So I would say, overall, the, the whole concept of you know, you really need to not do things alone. Think about it, the integration. And there's a, a number of these things where we bring those times, talents, and treasures together in a way that can produce some, some really useful science. But it is indeed, as Steve mentioned, quite fragile. And it's all based upon people, which is both good and bad. You know, the good is it's creative, incredibly creative ideas that come out that I would never would have thought of. The big challenge for a lot of organizations is that I would say what comes out of the folks and those relationships is not determinate. We love doing science experiments and there's only a range of possible outcomes and it always comes out the same. When you deal with people, it's not a determinate thing. So hence, hence the challenge for you. Anyways, um, I would just close on that. Um, after working decades in the system and statewide, um, I chose to come to IEP. And the reason I came to IEP was because of the collaborative approach and that leadership aspect that I saw. Not, you know, like you have a big taskmaster somewhere, but it's broadly distributed and people really thinking about how could we get to the coulds versus, gee, this is what we have to do today. So. Assuming we're going down the road. Um, I'm Kaylee Allen. I'm the field supervisor of the San Francisco Bay Delta Fish and Wildlife Office with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I really appreciate the opportunity to participate on this panel. 
The service is a member of IEP and it participates at all levels of IEP in, in the organi organizational structure. Um, it does a lot of the science and monitoring that's conducted under the IEP umbrella. Um, we depend on IEP for many of our management decisions and we have a role in regulating IEP under the Endangered Species Act. Um, the office that I supervise, the Bay Delta Fish and Wildlife Office, um, has staff that participates in the project works teams and on the science management team. Our Lodi Fish and Wildlife Office represents the service on the coordinators group, and our, direct, our regional director, Paul Souza, represents us at the director's um, meetings, also um, assisted by Assistant Regional Director Dan Castleberry. The Bay Delta Office serves regulatory functions in the Delta, including authorizing take of um, endangered species associated with IEP activities. So I've been in the office for a couple of years now. Um, I'm still learning my way around IEP since our office doesn't play a huge role with IEP. Um, but I have spent most of my career in and around um, multi-agency um, groups like IEP. Um, so much of my perspective, I would say, comes from the regulatory side um, and our efforts coordinating through IEP on the EDSM, the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring that Steve talked about, and on the Directed Outflow Project that we did this year. So, I wanted to first talk about um, the function that IEP serves for the service in, in regards to inc incidental take. So there's a biological opinion with IEP um, that authorizes take for IEP activities. We coordinate each year with IEP to, to sort of determine the level of take that would be allowed in that year based on um, multiple factors. And I think that IEP serves a very valuable function for us in that they then take that allotment of take and spread it out amongst various activities. So we really rely on IEP for their function of um, analyzing the technical merit uh, and the scientific merit of the studies that come through. And that's a great value to us so that we're not sort of getting hit with, you know, we need 10, we need 20 and trying ourselves to um, evaluate the merit as against all the different projects that are going on in the Delta. Um, I think we've we've made a lot of progress with IEP in terms of how we do that, and I think we're working pretty well together. Um, we made some improvements this year that I think are really helpful, and I'm, I look forward to our continuing that relationship. Um, another place that I think IEP uh, really excels is in the coordination um, amongst the agencies. The agency staff associated with IEP does a great job of coordinating. I think IEP suffers from its own success in some ways on that coordination. Um, I think agencies, when a program is up and running and running well, they tend to cabin off the staff that do that project and they work, you know, they work with each other in terms of coordinating between the agencies but don't always do a great job of reporting back within the agency. And once the project has really been a long-standing project, there's less need for oversight. Um, it's not the shiny new project. So I think IEP is suffering from that a little bit. I think the interagency coordination is great. I don't think the internal agency coordination that I've seen, at least, is as functioning. Um, and that's one thing that I think both internally to the agencies and within IEP, we need to foster a little bit more um, collaboration and inclusiveness, um, and I think that would be helpful. Let's see. So one area that I think, um, where I think we do need some improvement and that I've heard quite a bit about over the last couple of years is um, inclusion of stakeholders in the IEP process. Obviously, IEP is an agency process, there is a stakeholder group, although I don't think that's as utilized as well as it probably should be. And I've particularly heard that there's a lack, or at least the stakeholders feel that there's a lack of involvement at the policy level. Um, and that's one thing that I think 
IEP either needs to, we as agencies need to figure out how to make IEP have a bigger tent or to hook all the tents up that we, we have so that there's more um, engagement between different forums where stakeholders are present. And that's one thing that I think we do need to work on. Um, I also have um, some follow-up on Steve's comments on EDSM, but I think I can wait till the next part of the panel for that. So pass it along. So I'm Ted Summer. I'm the lead scientist with California Department of Water Resources. I think it's safe to say my career here with the state has kind of been defined by IEP. Um, I've been here something like 28 years. I've gone from being one of the knuckleheads in the back of the bus to helping drive the bus. Uh, so seen it from a lot of different perspectives. Um, I want to tackle a couple of your questions, first with regard to coordination and second with regard to synthesis. First on the coordination side, um, given how contentious water is in California, I think we've done a pretty good job. Just the f potential forces that could just absolutely blow everything apart in any given year are astounding and the fact that we've been able to keep things going for 40 plus years really says something um, that folks have been working very hard to do things. Um, the other thing I, I want to mention, and this is a little touchy feeling, is that the IEP plays an important social function. Um, agencies find it difficult to find common ground um, and science is one of the places where at least some of us can talk together. So IEP for me has been one of the places that we've been able to develop more trust than other areas of, of the water issue. Um, it also serves other functions as well, um, mentorship. Uh, within an individual agency, you don't necessarily see a, a, a mentor for something like science, but across the broader community, we really help one another a lot, and that includes specific training opportunities. There's a lot of different parts to how we do the coordination. Um, I think you've heard some of the components, the project work teams, which are you know open forums. Uh, Kaylee mentioned inclusiveness. Those project work teams are open um, to folks. The meetings are announced you know, on the web. People can walk in off the street and just show up. We also uh, have quarterly directors meetings, stakeholder meeting, uh, annual meetings. We put a science strategy on the web so that people can look at things. Um, those are ways that we can try and increase transparency and outreach, but um, the other big thing is a lot of us are very, very active in trying to go to a lot of different forums. So particularly those of us who are on the management team and the coordinators um, are active in management forums, so there's a lot of cross-pollination with uh, groups like CAMPT, CSAMPT, uh, WaterFix, Delta Smelt Working Group, DOS. Um, there's usually at least one or more people um, that, that overlaps there. Also, with respect to funding and doing other projects, um, we try and uh, work and talk as much as possible with other funding entities. Uh, SWIFCA um, have their own science program. We review some of their proposals. We talk to them about shared priorities. Um, there is overlap with Prop 1. So Greg, for example, helps a lot with Prop 1 funding to make sure that individual agency funding tries to meet some of the, the shared needs. Also, uh, a number of us in IEP um, try and serve a mentorship role for the broader scientific community. So a number of us serve as uh, fellow mentors for the Delta Science Program fellowships. Um, this all comes with a price um, and a number of obstacles. Um, honestly, the number of issues IEP is supposedly responsible for is just absolutely staggering. Over the 28 years I've seen, I don't know, order of magnitude plus number of issues, it's way more complicated. And, you know, it's at times 
not feasible to cover all of the things people expect us to. Um, the other related thing is the coordination at times is excessive. If you looked at our calendars, the number of meetings we have to attend for coordination, it's, it's bizarre. Um, the other part of this is high turnover. We do burn through staff pretty quickly because the expectations are high. Um, this includes staff within our organizations, but often at the management level. So there's this constant training going on within our individual agencies, um, across our different groups, and then training our, our new bosses. Um, and I do want to echo what you heard before. One of the biggest things we face is that, that tension between individual agencies and their missions versus the shared thing. And we have a culture that kind of promotes the shared thing, but it's always hard to tell your own organization, no, this is value. We need to stick with it and, and do what's right for the group. A uh, couple solutions with regard to coordination I did want to mention. Um, I'll be blunt, resources are a big issue. Um, we've been pretty flat in terms of the number of people to run this. As Greg said, we've upped our game with regard to coordination, transparency, running things. Um, and again, we have high turnover. We're burning through staff. We need to share the load. Um, the other uh, component is co-location. Um, this is something it's probably fairly obvious, but we have all these agencies that are in silos, and some degree of co-location is warranted. And I think many of you know one of the projects we've been pushing is at least a co-located field station. Um, I think that could help with, with some of the issues I mentioned. The other thing I wanted to talk about is our role as a synthesizer of information. And this, to be honest, is the biggest change in IEP and my career here. Early on, um, we did studies, we collected data, but honestly, there really wasn't that much synthesis other than individual investigators or a couple writing up different things. And that changed around the time of the pelagic organism decline when some of us finally got our chance to help run things a bit. And I think since then, we've had a whole series of teams that I think are a pretty good illustration of our ability to work together on, on complicated interdisciplinary issues. And so I, I think some of them, Steve uh, and Greg mentioned the flash, the delta smelt mast, the drought mast. Uh, now there's the, the flow alteration mast. Again, these are multi-institution uh, groups. They're diverse backgrounds. I think uh, a lot of this has been helpful um, in a management setting. Um, and this includes not just kind of data crunching, but also integrating some of the work we do with modelers. That's been a, another big change. Um, issues that we face uh, in the synthesis, uh, again, there's this, the staff. Uh, some of our groups have been trying for years to get dedicated staff. We've been begging and borrowing our own agency. We've tried five years running to ask for positions and have had no luck getting staff. So we, we found a way to get people to work on things, but it's been difficult getting our, our state reps to realize that we actually need people to get this done. Um, and then the last thing is we just frankly have a stunning amount of data and information to process. Um, even if we have those staff, it's going to take a while to, to crunch through everything. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Brown with the U.S. Geological Survey at the California Water Science Center in Sacramento. Um, I've been there since 1991. Um, I kind of had some early contact with IEP in the mid-1990s when I briefly worked for the Bureau on a detail. Decided I, I didn't really like that. <laughs> so I went back to USGS and worked on uh, rivers and streams otherwise. And then about a decade ago, um, when the pod was heating up, that's when I got back into IEP in a more uh, regular way. 
And uh, for the last decade, I've sort of served on the science management team and been heavily involved with the synthesis efforts have, that have been talked about. Um, as, as usual, when you get to the end of the line in a panel like this, I don't really have much to add to what Steve, uh, I think, gave a very good overview, overview of IEP and kind of how complicated it is. I think Greg and Steve focused on kind of how fragile it is. I mean, at the science management team, which is kind of my perspective, you know, USGS doesn't have any management responsibilities, so I don't get as involved in all the alphabet soup of CSAMPT and CAMPT and, and all that stuff, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> my tolerance for meetings is relatively low. <laughs> um, but on the science management team, I mean, you really see, you know, a group of people that are interested in solving problems, getting together and working together, and everybody helping each other to get the job done. Um, and I don't think it's fully appreciated outside of the science management team, especially in the synthesis efforts, kind of, you know, the extra effort that is for people to invest in trying to do something to help the effort of keeping the estuary going. And, you know, Really, you know, I published a lot of papers at USGS. Um, the stuff I do for IEP, I think, has probably had the most practical Im impact of most of the things I've done. Um, and, you know, even though professionally speaking, you know, an IEP technical report isn't a big feather in my cap, I think. You know, those things have provided valuable information to managers and policymakers in the system. Um, so, you know, I don't begrudge that time at all. Uh, and working with that, the group of people, the science management team, and also other people we bring in, you know, from academia or other groups to work on um, mass synthesis projects, you know, is really rewarding. Um, so I think that is a really good thing. I think, as Ted was saying, we've actually become pretty good at the synthesis thing. Um, you know, and in most things, you know, we don't expect everybody to agree with conclusions we reach or conceptual models we develop, but I think they provided the framework for a lot of the discussion that occurs about specific topics. So, you know, the, the Delta Smelt conceptual models that came out, I think have continued to provide a framework for other conceptual models um, till now. I mean, we're still using that conceptual model. Um, the FLASH uh, report, you know, is providing some of the basis for the stuff we're doing with the flow alteration team. Uh, so I think, you know, as we continue to do these synthesis efforts, you know, it provides a strong foundation for continued work in the system. Um, I'd also actually like to stress the role of the lead scientist. Uh, I think, you know, Anka, uh, Anka Mueller-Solger was our first lead scientist. She did a tremendous job for six years. Ted filled in interim when uh, we stole Anka from IEP, <laughs> and she came to work for USGS. <laughs> and then. I actually don't, how many years did it take? take two years? Um, yeah, so you know, the lead scientist job is, you know, if, if you looked at the advertisement for the IEP lead scientist job, you know, you wanted a senior university researcher to fill that job. <laughs> uh, the expect, expectations of that job are very high, and I think, um, Steve is doing a good job of filling those expectations. And that leadership role, I think, is important on the science management team, and it's important in, in other areas of IEP. Um, I think the other thing I'd like to stress is that um, communication has been mentioned a num many times uh, in the presentations of everyone here. And I do think that's probably the place where we need to make progress the most. So the, I mean, the synthesis reports we produced, 
you know, are fairly technical, you know, kind of uh, translating those for stakeholders and the public, policymakers is probably a step we need to do better at. And as Steve pointed out, and I think Greg pointed out too, you know, we hope to get some help in doing that. Um, so I think that's probably the other major thing we need to deal with. And kind of uh, as, you know, as IEP moves, if it's decided IEP will move into the adaptive management framework, whatever that is, um, you know, probably being more inclusive of stakeholders and stuff in IEP processes would be a requirement of that and how that happens is kind of an open thing that we've been discussing but haven't reached any conclusions at, at this point. So uh, I'll pass it on to Wim now. Thanks, Larry. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Wim Kimmerer. I'm with the newly named Eco no, Estuary and Ocean Science Center of San Francisco State University uh, at the Romberg Tiburon campus. Everybody got that? Um, I don't, obviously. Uh, so, so I'm the I'm the inside outsider or outside insider, whatever you want to say. Um, I've been involved with IEP for a, a long time. Um, my background is in biological oceanography. Uh, I call myself an estuarine ecologist. I mo mostly work in the upper estuary where there's no salt. Um, so, like some of my education was wasted, I guess. But anyway, uh, at least there's tides. <coughs> um, I'm a heavy user of IEP data. I was going to count it up how many paper, how many, what proportion of my papers contain IEP data, but I'll just make up a number, which is what we do these days, right? Um, about two thirds or three to three quarters of my papers have IEP, uh, are ones that I use IEP data uh, to, to figure things out. And so IEP data collection has been very valuable, and IEP has been very valuable to me as, as a, a source of collaborations and information and understanding and knowledge. So, um, so I'm a big fan of IEP, to be short about it. Um, oh, I was chair of the IEP's estuarine ecology team for about 20 years, almost 20 years, I think. Um, it was a very long time anyway, and um, I'm making that up too. Um, and that was kind of the prototype for the project work teams that IEP uses now. Um, so IEP's strengths, I'm going to just have a few things to say and I want to answer some of the specific questions that came in the little blurb I got. Um, the strengths are, I think, uh, continuity, um, continuity in various ways, despite the, the, the churn in personnel I keep hearing about. Uh, we, we do have a lot of continuity in personnel, like, like these folks, you know, so it's, it's really good. Uh, the interest in doing good science to support management. I think those, the good science part and the, and the management emphasis are really important. And then excellent field and lab crews, really well-trained and, and well-motivated. Um, weaknesses, um, the budget, we've heard. The role of the lead scientist, we've heard. Um, consistency of, of engagement with outside entities like outside scientists and, and stakeholders, um, and and turning data into knowledge. Now we've we've heard a lot about uh, about the number of papers that are produced, but if you compare that with the amount of data collected, um, there's there's kind of no comparison. There's there's been a lot of emphasis on a handful of the data collection efforts, and and not so much on the others. So we I think that's worth thinking about. Um, so the questions I'm going to try to address are about the governance structure and it's providing uh, cre credible and relevant scientific information. Um, and, and the first thing to say, for me to say, is I, I don't really know much about the governance structure. All, so all I can f focus on is the outcomes and what I can see from the outside. Um, I don't go to all these meetings, lucky me. Um, so, so it seems like this structure seems robust. And, and there are close working relationships among the agencies and with us outsiders, um, and, and a strong ethic for high quality science. And there's a somewhat flexible organization for getting things done. And I say somewhat because uh, we see some activities that seem to go on without 
anything being produced from them, and maybe it's time for a, a look at some of them. I'm not going to point any fingers at any particular ones. Um, the, the question went on to say, in support of management, managing the water export facilities in a way that can minimize harm. And I, I hope that's not what you guys are thinking, because that's astonishingly narrow. Uh, if you go back to the, you know, the original formation of the IEP, as, as summarized by uh, Perry Hergesell, um, it, it, it was originally to provide performance of studies necessary to obtain a thorough understanding of the requirements of fish and wildlife resources in the estuary. Well, that's way broader than how many Delta smelt get killed at the pumps, and which is not a very interesting question, even though I've written about it. And it's not very interesting when I wrote about it either. Um, so, well, that's, first of all, it's a very broad uh, charge, and it's also naively optimistic, you know. And, and, you know, Greg has pointed out, you know, several people have pointed out how much we've learned and, 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 uh, and how far we've come and how the, how the, 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 uh, the, the program changes and, and, and adapts. And that's, you know, that's essential and that's what it's done. I think, I think now we would all agree that we couldn't do what that says in a million years with a million, you know, with, with, a, with a huge budget. So, um, so the, um, so the vision and the mission of IEP has, has become sort of in a way broader and also in a way more realistic uh, in, in terms of what it can do. Um, so does IEP have the ability to use ecosystem forecasting mechanisms to anticipate environmental change? Um, probably not forecasting. Um, historically, we as a, as a, you know, if I can include myself, I think I can, um, get blindsided by, by events and, and things that come up. And the pod is a great example. Um, you know, it led to a lot of great science, but it was all retrospective. And, and remarkably, you know, the, when that first came up, everybody knows what I mean, right, the pod. Um, when that first came up, the managers, as I understand it, were adamant, were, were angry that, that their, their agency people hadn't or anticipated it or figured out what was going on immediately. Well, okay, so you've got processes, estuarine processes and population processes going on, and you're measuring body counts. That's, that's all. You know, how many fish did you catch and how big were they? Um, will not tell you anything about the processes underlying why there are more or fewer fish in the estuary. Uh, so, you know, so the whole, the whole program was built on an unrealistic premise in a way um, that, that I think the pod highlighted and since then, there have been a lot of efforts to sort of improve that by looking at things like diets and, and, and growth rates and so forth, involving outside people in some cases. Um, but we're still, we're still kind of missing the boat. We, we're still not deep enough into the process part of things. Um, night sampling, for example, nobody samples at night. We went out sampling at night for lungfin smelt, caught a hell of a lot of lungfin smelt more in the, than in the daytime. Not, well, I shouldn't say a hell of a lot. We caught more, more. You never catch a lot, um, and and using things like sonar, um, there are some uses of sonar. We we tried that uh, at uh, the suggestion of Steve Brandt, um, and found that there were an awful lot more fish out there than we were actually collecting in our nets. So that's something we need to look at more. Um, so in terms of of forecasting, I think we have a long way to go, and. And, and again, we, we shouldn't be too overly optimistic about our ability to do that in this system with, with its complexity. Um, what is IEP's ability to communicate this information to agencies? Uh, well, I thought that scope of that question was too narrow because uh, it's not just agencies who use the information and it's, uh, it should be everybody. And I think it is. I think that's, I think that's what people are telling us here. Uh, particularly Steve's talk, um, and and doing well with published papers. Again, not using all the data to the extent that they could be used. Um, but what about translation? Steve commented on this translation to managers and and the, and the public. I, I think there, there's probably a lot to be done there. Um, the role of IEP as a synthesizer of information about the Delta and as a nexus for the creation of science narratives about the needs of the Delta. Um, I don't know what the needs of the Delta are. I don't think anybody knows. Um, but 
in, in specific cases, IEP has done an excellent job in, in synthesis recently. Uh, we talked, to, we heard about the various mass reports and, and, and in syntheses, um, and also participation in NC's working groups uh, and publications. Um, but again, most of this is reactive, it's backward looking. So if we start talking about uh, forecasting or looking forward, we need to be thinking uh, more broadly. Um, most of this work is focused on fish, partly because of ESA demands, and rather than on the ecosystem, but, um, but there has been funding scraped off from various places to support some of us working on sort of more ecosystem processes. Um, the long-term perspective um, is, in terms of what has been funded, is really missing. Um, for example, the big tunnels. What has been done to anticipate how the tunnels or something like them will change the ecosystem? Hardly anything. This is partly my fault, going way back. But um, what, what about the SAC regional plan? You know, we're just starting some studies of that. And we went to visit the, the plant a few months ago, and you know they're well on their way to of construction. So, so that's happening, and we're not going to be really ready to to see how that changes things if it changes things. Um, when look, being a little pessimistic here, when Delta smelt go extinct or are functionally extinct, how is IEP going to adapt to that? How, how is IEP going to change? The 20 millimeter survey will be obsolete at that point what do we do next? Um, you know, these kinds of long-term change should be anticipated, but they're not being anticipated. And I point the finger here, not at IEP, but everybody. You know, the, the Delta Science Program, uh, IEP, and, and, and the agencies, and everybody really should be thinking about this. Um, how well are the various components working to produce new science? Um, and can we approve IEP efficiencies? Well, I, you know, I'll beat this drum once more, a steady source of funding from somewhere to support science both in and outside of the IEP agencies um, would be a huge help. Um, you know, I've been, I've been doing this stuff in this eight, in the estuary for over 20 years, and um, there was a time when one could rely on an annual RFP from somebody, either IEP or, or Delta Science Program, uh, right now, I'm funded by, I think, five different agencies or five different entities. Uh, one of them is Delta Science Program, but it's special studies, it's directed studies. And uh, SWIFCA, uh, Prop 1, uh, Department of Water Resources, TED's group, um, and, uh, and, you know, this, this is great for my lab, but it's, it's, it's chaotic, you know, it's, it's not steady. And when you're, when you're getting funded to do studies of, you know, the barrier and the spring bloom, and they're all short-term, they're all focused on, oh, what happened last week or last year, and not, hope, not focused on what's going to happen in the upcoming years. We have some projects working on that, but not, not all of them. Um, give the IEP lead, lead scientist some discretionary budget. I think, I think that's, you know, his role right now is as a, as a pleader and, a, and, a, and, a, and an arm twister. If he had a discretionary budget, I don't know how much money, um, he could, you know, he would have a lot more impact, let's put it that way. Um, and this could help alleviate this conflict of interest that the agencies have with, within themselves between doing agency stuff versus doing uh, IEP stuff. And, and then, Tracy, you mentioned camaraderie. Um, you know, there's, there's a, I think there's a tremendous amount of camaraderie within IEP and between real IEP insiders and us outsiders, some of us outsiders. Um, a lot of that was fostered back in the good old days when we went to Asilomar. It's a false economy not to go to Asilomar, and we should start, it, start doing it again. That's all. Thank you. Uh, does anybody on the panel want to comment on anybody else's statements? And uh, then we'll open it up for questions both from the uh, science, uh, independent science board and from the audience.
I just wanted to provide a little bit of background about the enhanced delta smelt monitoring, and I don't want to take us off track, so um, I, it won't take long. Um, but so in, in response to the question, so it was included in the WIN Act, um, or an enhanced survey was included in the WIN Act as something that was required. And at that time, we had been working on the enhanced delta smelt monitoring program to accomplish a few different objectives. Um, one, it is helping us with our development of a life cycle model for delta smelt, um, and particularly with calibration of that life cycle model. Also, we were really looking at a way to provide more real-time distribution information about smelt. So one of the questions that we have to answer each week during the operation season under the biological opinion is, you know, what's the risk of entrainment to delta smelt that week? And do um, all the middle river flows need to be more positive to reduce that risk? And that's really hard to do when you don't know how many smelt are in that area. You know that there are smelt in that area, but you don't know, um, you know, what the proportion of the population is in that area to other areas. So that's one of the things that um, enha the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program is, is getting at. Um, I think that, as Steve said, the long-term studies have tremendous benefit. They just can't always answer the exact questions that we're trying to answer from a management standpoint. Um, and particularly when we're doing the real-time operations and it really is a weekly decision, the person who has to sign that determination, it's hard to do when you don't have the information that you feel you need to be able to really make that call. And so that's really why EDSM came about. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, oh, I was just gonna, a couple other follow-ups, but if you have an answer, question for her, go ahead. I just want to follow up on a, a couple things. One is um, on the uh, putting things out and reaching out to the universities. You know, one of the things we lack by not having the ability to put out PSPs and those calls on an annual basis, I think we need to think about the types of questions you ask when you put out those requests. Right now, we're more focused on the directed and very specific. We don't engage that broader thing in that broader mind to try to for also formulate the questions. And so that part I think is missing. We do partner, and I think Steve mentioned it with Prop 1. Of course, that's got its own limitations. But I think having those things integrated between programs or um, I, I definitely like the idea of um, something where the lead scientist can, who is right there has the ability to plug in and augment things most efficiently is, is good. Um, one other thing that I, I wanted to follow up um, on one of Kaylee's comments on the stakeholder that truly is a big thing. How, when, where do we engage stakeholders? And I don't mean just engage them, but allow them to be involved and provide input and understand what's going on. A lot of the misperceptions about the program come from the fact that there's a black box, right? You, you don't know what's going on. And people are wonderful pattern makers, and they assume what's going on. Um, even internally, oh, well, how did that decision get made, that policy part? Well, actually, it happened within an agency, not within the IEP. So that communication and, and managing that was something to do um, that we have to deal with. But in terms of sort of general stakeholder engagement, the the direction we've been given or had discussion um, this year when we had an offsite was we want to develop stakeholder engagement that goes across the programs. So between what we do in IEP, we do in CAMP, we do with DSP, how do we integrate that so that folks understand how all these pieces fit together and there is that proper connection, not that each one needs to do everything, because then you're just creating clones, right? But how do we do that? So I just want to throw that element in that we need to do it, but how do we do it? Yeah. Yeah. And just to that point and to what Katie said in her brief comments, that issue of how you get stakeholder involvement at the policy level when different agencies are responsible for their own policies, I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer. We'll, we'll, we'll try to come up with some suggestions. They'll probably be crazy. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's, again, it's one that a lot of other systems face. Um, but for something like IEP and for the 
collaborative work that you're all talking about and that has tremendous potential, um, we've got to at least try to, to, to openly address that, get input as to ways to do that, and see how much room there is within the agencies. I, I think that compared to other systems that I'm familiar with, at least here in the state of California, you've got a single state and you've got, um, you don't have a lot of other sovereign nations, at least under the terms of the treaties, um, and you don't have Canada. Um, so I think there's a shot to do some of that, but yeah. it's, it is a really difficult issue that I think, I think as we go through this process, we'll probably be picking your brains more as to what processes you're trying to envision for that and, and how it could work. I'd like to ask everyone sort of a general question, and I'm sure there's uh, at least 100 different answers to this question, so I'm, I don't expect an answer, but more or less just your opinion. Um, we've heard throughout, uh, um, when we're talking about our monitoring programs, and particularly IEP monitoring, that uh, a very, very large share of that is compliance monitoring, uh, meaning to inter first interpretation is compliance monitoring means no, not a lot of flexibility. Also heard, uh, you know, um, uh, regulatory mandates and things like that. And, and I know from a federal point of view, everything you do is either a regulatory uh, or legislative mandate, executive order, or has to be done under some authority. But that still allows a lot of flexibility. So I guess I'm trying to get a sense from the IEP point of view, and much of the work is monitoring, you know, how much flexibility is there? Can you, uh, can you, you know, one could argue that I need the sample uh, for smelt, you know, like we just heard every week in this particular location for this particular reason, or someone needs to assess on the other side the, uh, uh, the health of the smelt in the, in the delta, which provides you with a lot of flexibility in how you do it. Uh, so can you comment about the, how much flexibility you think you have? Um, I'll, I can just give my opinion. It's somewhere on that dashed line between shalls and shoulds. You know, ultimately, those are the things that when we call them compliance, you can find it somewhere in a, in a biological opinion, a water rights decision, that this needs to be done. They often aren't super explicit, but there's an understanding or they're based upon what it was at the time or the last time that was reviewed. So I think there, you can do some adjustments towards the should, um, but in order to do that, it takes a lot more communication and coordination because then it goes outside the IEP in a sense. Um, obviously, when we do those things, we want to have independent review and we do those and we use the SAG or um, other mechanisms. But you also need to then work with those other units within those agencies who were requiring that monitoring because it's verifying an assumption and an opinion or it's its operational um, trigger. So you have to go back and understand why and have that back and forth dialogue, um, which is a, is a, is a, a more complex, a, a bigger lift. So it's um, a little bit more challenging, not undoable, but challenging. I if you have. I think this is an interesting question because I mean, some of, what we do comes, like, say, from the WIN Act. You know, it requires us to do this in certain surveys. Does it require us to do EDSM per se? You know, we could probably modify that and still fit within the Act. So I think a lot of what we do, there's some, as Greg said, there's some wiggle room in there. It's some somewhat gray. But I also think that IEP being comprised in part of the regulatory agencies, it's incumbent upon us to go back and look at some of what we've required over the years and whether we've answered the questions that we were trying to answer with what we've already done. Are those surveys or monitoring still things that we need? And are we getting the bang for our buck out of what we're doing? Because as, particularly with Delta Smell, as a species um, goes hopefully not in the way Wim said, but is certainly becoming more scarce, <laughs> Um, we need to make sure that we're utilizing all the data we can from each fish um, that we take and that we're employing newer methods also that maybe are, you know, non-lethal to smelt. So I think, I think we really do need to go back and 
look at what we've required over the years and whether it still makes sense for all those requirements to be in place because they tend to just build off each other and some of them I think still need to be there and some of them maybe they don't and we should be looking at that. Add, it, it kind of depends on what the question or interest in. Within the existing surveys, a lot of what we do in IEP is figure out, oh, how we can piggyback on existing surveys. No, we can't just not do the surveys, but as Kaylee was saying, everybody is so valuable for Delta Smelt that there's all kinds of work going on with each individual fish. Um, since I think 2010, there's been a lot more simultaneous food web and water quality work. So for uh, fall midwater trawl, for example, not just collecting the fish and looking at how turbid the water is, but um, collecting more detailed water quality data, simultaneously collecting zooplankton samples. Um, you know, every year is different and this is part of what we do on a regular basis in the management team. Someone comes up with an idea and we talk about how we can fit it in. Right. Of course, there's always, you know, the, um, the necessity to be able for many of the agencies who are funding specific activities, you still have to be able to be, put that tie back to why it's required because folks paying their water bill do not want to pay for something they don't have to. I mean, there's some rules there, right? So we need to be very cognizant of that and make sure we're doing the best science. I think the most recent example might be some of the work with Longfin where we were able to adjust some things and there's a, a, a team looking at some of the Longfin work. So, you know, that might be an example to look at. In, in trying to put together some of the different things that people said, uh, one of the m comments that Kaylee mentioned was that, you know, the people that are working in I IEP are not necessarily good at bringing things back to their own agencies. One of the other things was that the stakeholders are getting them involved and, and very often going beyond the group that's working on a specific project. I mean, does it come down to what Ted's saying that the projects have just gotten so big and the issues are so strong that it's just, you, you just can't possibly uh, have these things functioning? I mean, is that the issue? There's just so many problems that it's just not uh, a matter of just, just personal logistics. I, I think it's less the structure as simply the magnitude. I, I, I think we can do it, but, you know, again, one of the things I try to do is encourage each of the agencies and folks at different levels, and it is really hard even when people are trying to communicate between the PIs and maybe their senior scientist or their lead scientist to their managers, how do you get the key kernels going back and forth to be able to guide their own participation and investments. We're really talking about collective investment. The collaboration, I think, works really good. The working between folks, getting those things justified, getting it communicated so that folks know from the time that you get something approved to the time you get results and how you close that loop, that's really hard. And I, it, Agencies change over time, and somebody mentioned the rollover. That is, that is sort of a succession problem and a communication problem that we all have to work on. I don't think it's unique to IEP or endemic to it. Also, you know, you look at, at collaborations that are successful, they're almost always bottom-up collaborations. It's not, it's not top-down collaborations. Dick? Yeah, that's, that's good lead-in. Because I'm very surprised, because I think of IEP as science-initiated, and for many years it's been a refuge for agency science. It's, it's a place where scientists can talk with scientists and be scientists, and uh, you know the, the difficulties it has had with its agency coordinators, uh, and it has been a science-driven place, and. And that's been tremendously important for California science, California water science. And now I hear you saying, and now we need to engage more with stakeholders, but I also hear you saying you're just having tro trouble, you know, doing enough interagency communication and coordination as well. And you can't do it all. And, and so the, 
you know, the, the things you say you want to span, you can't add on the stakeholder communication too. And I wonder, isn't the stakeholder communication really something that is the agency's bailiwick? Does the IEP really deal with stakeholders? I, f I fully agree that the science community needs to deal with stakeholders. The climate science community needs, needs to deal with stakeholders. The water science community needs to deal with stakeholders. But is it, you know, given the IEP and its structural issues, does it need to deal with stakeholders? Well, I think we need to do it, but we need to do it deliberatively. And it's not the communication between agency, ironically. It's, there, there's within agencies is the, is the bigger challenge. I think when we do it, when I say deliberative, we need to be very clear about what we're trying to communicate and when and why and yeah. doing it in a useful way. And that's where you may be able to provide some input on that. One thing that does happen, and this is just a personal um, opinion, and I've seen it in many forums, and that is there is involvement in the regulatory process, in the policy process on how we do land management or operations of things, and in making regulatory decisions. And since science informs that, folks start, want to make sure that science is sound. So we need to engage people relative to science in an effective way, just recognizing there's going to be a bleed over of a desire on policy and regulation that might bleed in and confuse and make it more difficult. We can't take that on. Yeah. But engaging them on science, because for example, when we do the synthesis, sometimes they have really good ideas. We may not explore everyone, but we can at least acknowledge, hey, we followed these three leads. There's this other idea, but we weren't able to, to fulfill it, but it's something that the reader should be aware of. <laughs> Those kind of things, excuse me, I think are really valuable, but it is the science and it's getting the scientists together without some of the other things um, yeah. to keep that, that essence of, of the scientists working in a community. So, uh, If you guys had comments on that. I had, I had a comment, and this is spurred by, uh, by Dick's question. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent we don't understand correctly, and this is a, a broad statement, and I, I think we're realizing as a community that we don't do some of the, uh, understand some of the social dynamics between these entities very well, and, and, and it would improve our abilities to satisfy needs if we did understand these very well. So, for example, I don't necessarily understand why when the IEP is asked to go off and describe, for example, what the feeding history of the smelt that we caught this year had to say about their ability to survive in the estuary, why that can be perceived as not relevant at some level to an agency director. And so I guess what I'm missing is um, I, I apparently don't understand when he or she asks me, what do I need to know about Delta smelt? And I start talking about the food web or the thermal history of the smelt that, you know, that, that, that's not what they're talking about, right? And so I'm wondering if there isn't a room here for an exploration of, um, you know, I, I think we, we understand that science needs to be management relevant. But what does that what does that really mean? Like, do you really mean that I need? No, I, I, that, you I, know I, what I mean? I, I think that? you do need that history. You do need that background to be management relevant. Because without that background, you 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 won't know that a pod might happen in the next six months or something like that. Right, so, I, so I, exactly, that, that would have been how I would have answered that question too, which leads me to the next thought, which is, are, are, we, are we not providing information that's of use to the agency directors because we're not capable of answering their questions? If their questions are, you know, I want to turn a knob and I want to get more smell. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an expectation here that I don't think we've fully explored and that I think you know we're discovering is is really difficult to yeah. to match with traditional science and traditional management discussions. 
yeah, traditional expectations of policymakers. And that management relevance really is at what time scale? Yeah. Do you have to be management relevant? And the farther your time scale is, the more it's uncertain as to how well your information is going to inform management. And so the natural management requirement is to compress that time scale to make it very short time relevant. And science says, in order to really understand and to do, to even think about eco forecasting, as we talked about, you've got to go to a longer time scale. So there's just that natural tension. But we all know it, but we don't know what to do about it. Are there any comments from the public? Oh, uh, Liz, please sort of to take us in a different direction, but uh, I was uh, struck by the fact that many of you talked about um, turnover and burnout of, of uh, staff and, and training, time spent training new staff, et, et cetera. So I guess, you know, I, I'd just like to have a little bit more background information about maybe like the, the demographics of the IAEP and, you know, what you know, I guess thinking about how to maybe bring new people into IEP or have people thinking about IEP earlier in their careers, um, perhaps engagement with students and postdocs and just, you know, again, leveraging other opportunities. So I, it's just a general question to the group, but any insights about the demographics and ways to uh, think about the future of, of the uh, program. It, it's no surprise that we agencies are facing the same demographic changes that a lot of other <laughs> workplaces are facing, an aging workforce. Um, and succession planning is one of the huge issues. And um, we've obsessed a lot about it in IEP, we've met and brainstormed about some strategies. Part of it, as you said, is outreach to things like campuses, uh, professional society meetings, and so forth, letting people know about the opportunities. I mentioned the mentorship thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's extra work, but making the effort to try and work with students on campus, serving on committees, um, going to recruiting events. Um, we have, though, been missing out on that old funding pool that you mentioned, where there was more consistent funding on campus, so there were more consistent pools of students that would be interested then in continuing to, to work on things. But it's, it's certainly, you know, on our radar screens um, with regard to bringing people in, maintaining staff, um, that's more challenging and it's something we're talking about taking a more active role in helping to build cross-agency bonds between us because the pressures within individual agencies are often staggering so using the group of agencies to help reinforce and support one another I think is going to be an increasing approach yeah I think something that to didn't t touch on, but I mean, within these large state and federal agencies, I mean, the path promotion is not sitting in the same desk for 20 years. <laughs> you know, you go someplace else to do, do your next step and you might come back or go off someplace else. So, um, I, you know, that's, I think, kind of a, a big thing. And so ES is that you know, train in the Delta, go someplace else, you know, for their next level up. And that's just how agencies work. So, and there's no way to get around that, I don't think. I, I think beyond the demographics of we have a number of really good scientists that are within that range of retirement, for example, they're staying on because they're doing some really important work and want to do it. So that's one of the reasons, that's a key thing we got to focus on. But also, we have tried very hard in recent years both to take on more things and people stretch and uh, keep ourselves lean. The downside of that is by being lean, we have a, not as deep of a bench. 
So when we lose one of our stars and has that experience, we don't have as many people there ready to shift over. I think we're attracting some folks. I think the having a, um, a research center where we're co-located will be a huge draw. But right now, I think it's, it's pretty low. We're sorry. Your conference is ending now. Please hang up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that was it. Dick, go ahead, and then we'll like to get some comments from the audience, please. Yeah, Greg, you've said co-located many times, but you can, can only co-locate with one agency. I mean, you'd be co -lo if you can bring a lot of people together, you'd be co all together. But, but it sounded like you wanted the advantages of having multiple agencies together rather than just the co-locating of the people from the agencies together. Yeah, I don't know, Ted, maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, we want to bring the folks and actually have them in day-to-day -day contact with each other and working as a virtual team, as it, as it were. The, yeah, in the, in the years, our department was with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, there was a tremendous amount of collaboration that went on that isn't scheduled anywhere. It's just people naturally work together. Um, right now, one of the things we try to do is with our synthesis folks, my team regularly is uh, working with DWR and, and USGS, and they're expected to be a virtual office or a virtual team. But that's harder when you're spread out and you don't see everybody on a day to day. So yeah, I'm just thinking that's just one of the good, good directions we could go. Has anybody from the audience would like to make a comment or ask a question? It's easy after the first one, does it? Anybody else from the science board want to make a, Steve? i follow up a little bit on what I heard Wim say. And what I heard you say was that, that um, there should be more focus on process and that that's the only way we might be able to get to making predictions of POD and so forth and that there's some evidence that IEP has moved in that direction. Is that, is that what I heard? Well, it's what I said. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, well, you, you heard about the, uh, I think Kaylee said it, about the, about the use of each individual fish that's caught and going to be killed anyway, um, you know, so you can extract its otolith for growth rate and you can look at stomach contents and um, maybe you get some information out of, uh, uh, you know, a genomic study or, or something. And so, so you can use every bit of the fish to inform you about what it's been going through and what its, you know, what its state is. Uh, histopathology is another, another part of that. So, um, so that's, that's one example, but there, there are numerous other ones where, um, you know, people at IEP have evinced an interest in taking steps to, to discover things about, uh, well, about the food web, for example, about growth rates or reproductive rates or um, mortality rates and so on. Um, you know, these are all things that, you know, that well beyond what anybody was thinking about 20 years ago. Um, and they do inform you about uh, how the system supports the, the things you care about, namely fish, right? Following up on that, I, I know there's been a lot of work on, you know, life, uh, life cycle modeling and stuff like that. Is there, do you think there's a, uh, room for more of that in terms of physical biological interactions, multi-species or ecosystem level modeling, and is that something that IEP seems is, uh, is part of their mission? Well, I'd say it, it's definitely a, a, a topic of interest, and I've heard a lot of uh, discussions, we've had a lot of discussions about doing those kinds of things, um, and it is ongoing. Um, I'm actually involved with Kenny Rose on some more, and, and uh, Matt Nobriga's group at the Fish and Wildlife Service on uh, adapting our Delta smelt individual based model for use in the biological opinion um, investigations. Um, but more broadly, I think 
people are definitely interested in expanding our ability to model specifically with the relatively new tools. We have, we have a number of 3D hydrodynamic models available now and uh, trying to use those for various uh, ecological studies, which we, we've been doing and that's ongoing. Um. I think I just add that, I mean, folks on the science management team, I mean, we recognize that modeling is something we haven't done enough of, something we need to do more of. It's just a resource issue. N not too many of the folks on the management team are experienced modelers, and there's not enough money to go out and pull people in to work on that kind of thing. So, you know, it's, you know, as has been discussed, a lot of the effort goes into compliance modeling, uh, monitoring. Um, that doesn't mean we don't recognize the value of these other things. We just can't do them. It, it is a huge change, though, that we are making much heavier use. Um, one of the examples is I can tell you four different IEP projects where we're using the Untrim 3D model. In, combining that with biology to, you know, <coughs> maximize our information. Um, the other thing is I think there's pretty close contact between a lot of the IEP folks and the efforts to do the uh, Delta Smelt life cycle model at the service and at uh, NIMFS doing the salmon life cycle model. There's a lot of cross-pollination and workshops where people are trading information back and forth and there have been some big changes to our sampling programs, as you heard from Kaylee, but also on the salmon side, to try and feed more information into something the modelers can use. And I would add that as, as we confront different ways of doing this and, and putting our arms around uh, different nodes of expertise, one of the notions I floated in front of the directors that should be on their radar screen as we move forward into the adaptive management stage of estuarine monitoring science is that, you know, IEP shouldn't be expected to do it all, but that we might be a place that acknowledges uh, centers of excellence that exist in the estuary and that we make sure that our data is being made available to these centers of excellence or that our infrastructural support such as it can be uh, made available to such people. I'm aware of, of a number of, uh, I want to say burgeoning, I guess nascent uh, developments in, in real high quality world class science that, you know, only marginally touch on IEP and its resources. And I don't think we should trouble ourselves about sort of somehow taking ownership of that. And I know that's been an issue in the past. It's, quite the contrary you know identify those and articulate those to the to the to the directors and and tell them how even a minuscule investment in something like that that's outside their agency might really pay off for them and it doesn't necessarily have a tie to an an IEP program or a program manager i mean i, I think we 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 put blinders on if we consider ourselves to be the only thing or the only way when in fact as wim is here to demonstrate you know we've got tentacles that go lots of places let's acknowledge that and let's tell people about that steve one of the points you made in the beginning of your seminar was that there's 71 species of fish, there's 12 crabs, there's shrimp. Has, has there been any synthesis of those at the IEP level of that data? You know, if you talk about ecosystem, or is there mm -hmm. such an emphasis on the smelt that that just has not been able to come to the, the surface? Yeah, I, I'm entirely ready to be corrected here, but um, I think individual um, authors or groups of authors that use IEP data have done that. I'm less aware that that has been an IEP um, uh, objective or responsibility in and of itself. That's right. Which is also one really good use of IEP data too, by the way. <laughs> I think Peter Moyle and others have shown us the way <laughs> for some of those efforts and Jim Clern and Kathy Heeb and people like that. So. And so I was just going to ask, so in terms of synthesis, it seems like there are, there are endless opportunities. Is it mostly, it's just funding that's restricting the ability to, to move forward with some of the synthesis ideas that are out there? 
I would say that's one element. I would say people are otherwise deployed. I think the scientists have a universal enthusiasm. You're one of them. For synthesis, I mean, we love doing that kind of work. It's the last thing that we get to get to. Yeah, I would say that I think a lot of the people who are involved in those efforts have day jobs. And so, you know, the, the synthesis efforts take a long time because people are busy and, but they are a really meaningful part of what IEP does, I think. And so I think we should definitely be encouraging that. And it looks, it looks like you guys, there's like less than 10% of the funding within the organization currently goes towards synthesis. Is I think that was reflected in one of the pie charts. Yeah, one of the yeah. pie charts it looked like. That that. Was, so that would have been last year's budget. But is, there, is there a thought of trying to push that to a higher percentage, or is it just that the pie is so limited? I think it's, it's a combination of there is the funding, there's a desire, and I, I think it was Ted that mentioned, you also need to be able to not just add funds, but also add positions within agencies and doing those long-term things and pull from the expertise of those who know the species or the, you know, the system the most. So it's, it's a combination of pulling things together. So there's a little logistics and a, and a lot of money problem. Yeah. Well, and this speaks to the infrastructural arrangement issue that is in front of you all. I'm not aware that there are too many positions at any of the nine agencies that are dedicated to interagency synthetic efforts. I think people do it because they want to do it. I think there are a few, and CDFW has uh, one or two. Uh, the uh, Department of uh, Water Resources has been allocating certain members of its staff, and I'm not sure if it's written or unwritten to that effort, but um, there's not a lot of position descriptions that say you will engage in interagency collaboration in science. It may be a requirement to apply for the job, but I think once you get the job, you know, you're working for us. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the CDFW um, positions are indeed explicitly to IEP and providing the horsepower for teams working on things, not that they do everything. And that's two positions? That's actually three positions, yeah. But they're not the only ones doing it. You have folks like Larry that will take high percentages of their time for shorter periods, or Louise or some other folks in different agencies. But that, again, depends upon you know what the needs of their agency are. They do a great job with what they have. One last call from the audience for comments. Ah, someone's standing. I was afraid maybe he was walking outside. On the, on the panel, so uh, I've been kind of reluctant to, to jump up because you guys have covered a lot of things. But um, I want to, my name is Randy Baxter. I work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, State Department. And um, I've been an IEP scientist for almost 30 years now. And through that time, I've seen the collaboration go from pretty small to what I would consider mega size um, at this point. And during that, my individual agency went from having fairly good staff to do a lot of the work that we did and having some capacity to do um, some of the research type uh, studies associated with the monitoring that we were primarily involved in to losing that capacity circumstantially and and otherwise you know the state went through a couple um, downturns and it turned out that the studies I was working for had vacancies we lost those people you know and and have not really recovered from that you know the base study which was a which was a big example early on was, was my first um, career with the department. And uh, we lost one lab staff and two biological staff at least in the, the period that 
um, that I've been here. And it's just hard to do the same, the same work and have capacity to add to the synthetic activities that are going on um, at the same time, particularly when you have a year-round study like that that has so many different things. Um, I was really gratified to hear Steve's talk where he um, pointed out a number of the values to the, to the work that are pretty much unsung. You know, for a lot of the down bay shoreline development, the bay study is one place to go where they actually have some scientific or some information on what their impacts might be for expanding the South um, City Airport or some, um, doing the, the demolition on the pilings for um, the Bay Bridge when that renovation came through. So there are a tremendous number of values to, to the work that we do that that go unsung and it's it's a communication um, aspect and we we don't always have the the opportunities to speak at the right level to the right people um, to to help maintain this funding and then kind of the last thing that i wanted to to get to you know we've been talking about expertise and people that are um, important in the system and we've focused a lot on synthetic activities. Steve made the comment that we have a number of folks that work in the technical realm, the, the folks that identify fish and invertebrates in our labs are experts in their field and are collaborating with individuals and researchers up and down the, the west coast in some cases, but they're, they're at a dead end. You know, they, I, I don't even know what their salary is, I have to admit, um, but it's it's barely a working wage in California. And the same type of thing um, is present with our boat operators. You know, these guys have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment at their fingertips along with people of untold value and they're making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year after 15, 20, 25, 30 years of, of work. So we're, we're actively trying to improve upon those circumstances, but it's a, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge to, pee, to pay people for the value of their, of their work. And if you guys have any thoughts on, on how that might be done, um, appealing to government or however, um, would certainly appreciate it, but I, I want to recognize that um, you know they're the, the folks out in the field and the folks in the lab. They're the building blocks. If if we don't get those things right, then everything else kind of crumbles down. So I wanted to give my pitch there, and thank you for the opportunity. First, for all the science board members, we thank you very, very much for coming. Your insights were great. You certainly help, help us with the, uh, with the review we're doing. And Steve, thank you very, very much for your, your seminars. Really very good. So thanks, and uh, we'll certainly call on all of you again. Yeah, I would also like to, uh, on behalf of the board, thank Steve for an excellent seminar and the, and the members of the panel for spending an afternoon with us. We're really, and being uh, can, candid and informative, and your information will really help us a long ways in moving our, our review forward. Feel free at any time to provide us any other comments you have, just uh, if you forgot something uh, or didn't want to say it out loud, feel free to, uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking, but um, yeah, we really appreciated your, your input. I just want Steve to bring out the food and the pots that we get. <laughs> you enjoy your foo foo, do you? <laughs> so, on, on, uh, I guess that does it for today. So, we're going to adjourn for this afternoon as a, as a board meeting and we reconvene tomorrow at uh, 9 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.